Chair has a recommendation for your reading pleasure on the subject of antitrust. Senator I, uh, I know, uh, as Senator Klobuchar would say, uh, channeling uh, Taylor Swift, I know that all too well. Thank you for bringing up the Ticketmaster hearing that Senator Lee and I conduct. I'm sure we will have follow-up in writing, or maybe Senator Lee could ask a question about that. Thank I you. I can't match all of Senator Lee's quips <laughs> on this one, but I'm pretty familiar with Taylor Swift, so I'll do my best. Now you've got us started. Senator Cornyn. Attorney General Garland, you, of course, served in the judiciary for many years, and, and uh, before you became Attorney General, let me just ask, do you prefer to be called General Garland or Judge Garland? Uh, the senators of this committee can call me anything that they want. <laughs> well, with, we will with uh, all appropriate respect. I appreciate um, that part. Are you familiar with the strategy of the transnational criminal organizations that are flooding migrants across the border, overwhelming Border Patrol and other law enforcement authorities so that then the drug traffickers can move illicit drugs across the border? Are you familiar with that, uh, what I, I would call a business model? I am, and I set up uh, specifically directed the establishment of a task force on uh, anti-smuggling and anti-human trafficking for just the reason you said. Uh, it involves our uh, Civil Rights Division, our Criminal Division, and uh, the U.S. Attorney's offices all across, along the border, as well as our um, uh, offices in the uh, uh, Northern Triangle companies, uh, countries and uh, Mexico. I think you and I had this conversation earlier, maybe at your confirmation hearing, but I think uh, the Attorney General has the toughest job in, uh, in government, I believe, because you have to wear two hats. You are the chief law enforcement officer of the country, and you are also a political appointee and a member of President Biden's cabinet. But I think you also told us at the hearing, uh, your confirmation hearing, you repeatedly said that the executive branch cannot simply decide based on policy disagreements that it will not enforce the law. Is that still your position? Yes, it is, Senator. On uh, September the 11th, 2001, we lost about 3,000 Americans uh, to a terrorist attack. We declared a war on terror. The Congress issued an authorization for the use of military force. If you took the uh, size of an average 737 or a passenger jet today, holds between 145 and 185 uh, passengers, if you were to rack up all of the deaths that we've seen as a result of drugs coming across the southwestern border, as a result of this successful business model that the cartels have employed, you would be talking about the equivalent of a passenger jet per day crashing, killing everyone on board. I have been just uh, astonished at the lack of sense of urgency uh, to deal with this issue, um, it seems we become so desensitized to it that that sense of urgency is simply gone. But I will tell you that it's directly related to the open border policies of the Biden administration where people continue to come across the border, uh, turn themselves into a broken asylum system, or simply get away from law enforcement because they're overwhelming the Border Patrol's capacity. This is intentional, as you, as you acknowledge. It's a business model of the cartels, and they are getting rich, and students like those parents who I met with uh, last week in uh, Johnson High School in Hayes County, Texas, right outside of Austin, are losing their sons and daughters to fentanyl overdoses because of exactly this successful business model by the cartels. I wanna ask you a little bit about the prosecution policies of the, um, of the uh, Garland Attorney General's Department of Justice, um, sort of the bedrock standard for prosecuting crimes has historically been that the prosecutor shall, should pursue the most serious, readily provable offense um, and that that's been the bedrock of, of policy for, um, for uh, over decades. We know that uh, Eric Holder, when he was attorney general, changed that standard. And specifically, what I want to ask you is about 
two different memos that you've is issued to uh, prosecutors with regard to mandatory minimum sentencing. Um, and specifically, in the charging memo, uh, one of the charging memos, you said the proliferation of provisions carrying mandatory minimum sentences has often caused unwarranted, unwarranted disproportionality in sentencing and disproportionately severe sentences. Now, just to be clear, mandatory minimum sentences are statutory, correct? In other words, they're passed by Congress and signed into law by the president. Yes, that's right. And here, you, you suggest that prosecutors should not enforce or charge with um, charge defendants with a crime which carries a mandatory minimum under certain circumstances, correct? I did not, uh, it's not exactly, if I can just have a moment to explain. I'm very familiar. No, well, if you just answer the question. Yeah. So um, the memo says specifically, I'll just read it to you. It said, for this reason, charges that subject a defendant to a mandatory minimum sentence should ordinarily be reserved for instances in which the remaining charges uh, would not sufficiently reflect the seriousness of the defendant's criminal conduct danger to the community, harm to victims, or other considerations uh, outlined above. So basically, your charging memorandum says that prosecutors can exercise their discretion to charge less than the most serious offense because you don't like the mandatory minimum sentences that Congress has, uh, has passed, correct? It's no, Senator. This is a question of allocating our resources and focusing them on violent crime. Uh, later on, I thought you said I thought you said that uh, your job was to enforce the law with regard to without regard to policy differences. It's not a question of policy differences. It's a question of the resources. You we don't have, have enough money. You don't have enough, enough people. people. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough jails. We don't have enough uh, judges. Um, well, but, you've arrogated to yourself the 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 decision to make policy by saying that in spite of the fact that there are mandatory minimum sentences for many of these drug crimes which are now causing untold death and destruction across America, you're telling prosecutors don't charge those if they involve a mandatory minimum sentence. With, with respect, Senator, the memorandum makes clear that that general uh, uh, analysis doesn't apply in violent crime, doesn't apply in drug trafficking, doesn't apply in cases in which there's injury. So you're cherry-picking which cases that you will charge with a mandatory minimum sentence and I, not applying them uniformly and charging the most serious crime if, that can be proven if, at if trial. If we apply it to every single crime, we will not be able to focus our resources on violent crime and significant drug trafficking, on the cartels, on the people who are uh, killing people with fentanyl. So the purpose here is to focus the attention of our prosecutors and agents on the things that are damaging the American people in the largest possible respect. That's what the um, what this policy says. At 108,000 roughly Americans who died as a result of drug overdoses last year, 71,000 roughly of fentanyl overdoses. Do you consider your current policies successful? We, as I said um, in answer to another question, we have a huge epidemic of fentanyl problem uh, created by uh, intentional acts by the cartels. We are doing everything we can within our resources to fight that. We have our uh, DEA uh, working uh, to, uh, to prevent uh, transfer of uh, precursors into Mexico to capture the labs. Um, uh, to, to extradite the cartel leaders, to arrest them in the United States. We are focusing on fentanyl with enormous urgency. I have personally twice traveled to Mexico to try to get greater cooperation from the Mexicans on exactly the problem you're talking about. I have separately talked twice in person with the Mexican Attorney General for exactly the problem that you're talking about. There, we are focusing on this with enormous urgency. This is a priority of the Justice Department, but this is a whole of government problem. The border is a responsibility of the Department of Homeland Security. We do what we can do with respect to the jurisdictions that we have. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Senator Blumenthal. Mike Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Attorney General. Thank you for your time today. Listening to the questions and the answers and your responses, what is coming clear to me 
as I listen to this is basically in your DOJ, the Biden DOJ, there are two tiers of justice. There are one for people with conservative values, for parents, for people of faith, and then there is another tier of justice that applies to the Washington liberal elites, political elites. And what I want to do is dig down a little bit on how you and the department have applied this discretionary form of, of uh, justice. It's something that concerns Tennesseans, and when I'm across the state, we have 95 counties. I visit each of them every year. And Mr. Attorney General, that comes up quite a bit. Much of it has come up in relation to the Dobbs decision. And the attacks and the violence there has increased from groups on the far left. It has not increased from pro-life groups. And since the Dobb, Dobbs leak, there have been 70 pro-life pregnancy centers that were targeted. Only two of these activists have been indicted. There are 25 individuals that have been indicted under the FACE Act in just five months. So you see the disparity there. I appreciate you said that most of these attacks are carried out at night and that the protests take place during the day. So you say it's easier to identify and go after people that are carrying out a peaceful protest during the day rather than a firebombing at night. Is that correct? Yeah, if I, if I could just say, I wish you would um, assure your constituents in all the counties that the Justice Department does not uh, treat uh, uh, people in the way that uh, is, okay. is described. Well, we, treat, we treat like cases alike. We do not have one view. Okay, then let's for. talk about a specific case mm -hmm. in Tennessee, the Hope Clinic. Are you familiar with that? Um, I'm not familiar with it uh, the, Okay, uh, the Hope Clinic mm -hmm. for Women is a pregnancy resource center in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And currently, you have gone out of your way to prosecute 11 individuals in Tennessee under the FACE Act. And are you aware that this clinic was the subject of an attempted firebombing with a Molotov cocktail? So we are very concerned about these kind of firebombings, and I agree with you, they're happening around okay. the, the, the United States. Uh, the FBI has put its resources into this. We are investigating it uh, in every way. We've offered rewards for anyone who then has let's information. let's talk about how these groups get classified. When we talked about uh, the way parents of children were treated, and uh, because they were concerned over what was being taught in school. Senator Kennedy just went through that with you. Um, you applied domestic terrorism uh, as a term in couching that activity. Now, under federal law, which you have cited, this is how you term domestic terrorism, and I'm quoting, activities that involve acts dangerous to human life that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state. So under that definition, would you agree that firebombing a crisis pregnancy center constitutes an act of domestic terrorism? I would say yes, but I want to, again, disagree with your earlier characterizations. There was no memorandum about parents complaining uh, and their, uh, to their school boards. And Talking there was, about bombing, firebombing pregnancy I understand, and, and there was no um, reference in that memo to Would using domestic terrorism. Bombing, firebombing. Where it a said, yes, firebombing where. Domestic terrorism. It's at least domestic violent okay, extremism. Okay, so then let's talk about the far left group, Jane's Revenge, because they claimed responsibility for that. They went so far as to spray paint their name on the wall. So do you intend to prosecute them? We intend, if we find them, to do that. There is a oh, so you can't find them. If you have information about those groups, we, we well, would be is, happy to. That is your job. That's right, and we are putting it. heavy resources into this. We have found a group that. Say that's, they're a domestic terrorist organization. I, I would say it depends on. It depends on the people. Took, who took credit 
for this. Spray painted their name on the wall. We have, let me we let have, me ask you a couple of questions before my time runs out. Uh, we've talked a little bit today about the targeting at the justices' homes. Have you released any type of memorandum that explicitly condemns the acts of intimidation outside of the Supreme Court justices' homes? I have directly instructed the Marshal Service to send over 70 United States Marshals to prevent acts of violence and threats of violence outside those MO. I don't need to do a memo because I spoke okay. directly to the marshals about this topic. All right. Have you watched any of the footage of the protesters outside the justices' homes? Um, unless I caught it on the news, I haven't specifically watched it. Are you investigating any of those individuals? You said, you know, you investigate protesters because they uh, do their activity in, in the light of day. And most of the fire bombings and things take place at night, but I would think the FBI knows how to investigate crime. Uh, as I explained, our, our principal responsibility here is to protect the lives of the justices. We've put United but States- But you haven't watched any of that footage. The United States Marshals are on scene, watching what happens on scene. Any of those individuals that were protesting at the justices' homes were there for any reason other than to try to intimidate the, Mar justices. the marshal's job is to protect the lives of the justices, and they will arrest people who they think are threatening the lives of the justices. That's their job. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. I have to say, um, people in Tennessee talk a lot about their frustration. They want to trust the DOJ. They want to be able to trust their government. They are very concerned about what appears to be, by actions, two tiers of justice, and this is something that they do not see as equal treatment under the law. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Senator Welch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, I appreciate the work you've been doing on election infrastructure and security. Uh, we have our town meeting in Vermont next week. We're pretty proud of, uh, of that. You raise your hand. And Mr. Chairman, uh, Attorney General Garland, let, let me just ask you, d does your department have a problem with anti-Catholic bias? Uh, our department um, is, uh, 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 protects all religions um, and all ideologies. It does not have... Uh, any uh, bias against any religion of any kind. Well, you could have surprised me because given the resources that you are expending and the apparently intelligence assets that you are deploying against Catholics, it appears, and other people of faith while simultaneously turning a blind eye while people are executed gang style on the streets of our cities, including in my home state, I, your answer, frankly, surprises me. Let's talk about the Mark Houck case, for example. You've been asked about this already today, and frankly, your answers really astound me. This is a case where a Catholic pro-life demonstrator, father, was accused of disorderly conduct in front of an abortion center. The local prosecutor, the Philadelphia district attorney, who is a Democrat, a liberal, very progressive, declined to prosecute. There was a private suit that got dismissed. And then after all of that, your Justice Department sent between 20 and 30 armed agents in the early morning hours to the Houck's private residence to arrest this guy after he had offered to turn himself in voluntarily. Here's the photo once again. You can see the long guns. You can see the ballistic shields. You can see that they're wearing bulletproof vests. Why did the Justice Department do this? Why did you send 20 to 30 SWAT-style agents and a SWAT-style team to this guy's house when everybody else had declined to prosecute and he'd offered to turn himself in? Determinations of how to make arrests under arrest warrants are made based uh, by the tactical operators um, in the uh, district. They are not but you surely looked into it by this point, right? They you, you know the answer. Surely. They, all I know is what uh, the FBI has said, which is that they made the decisions on the ground as to what was safest and easiest. So you do not agree with your description of what happened on the scene. You don't agree with my description. I'm pointing out what the photo is. There are agents here who have long guns and ballistic shields. Let's take a look at the hardened criminals that your Justice Department sent these armed agents 
to go terrorize on that morning. Here they are. Here they are at mass. Here's the seven children with Mr. Houck and his wife. In this early morning, they were all at home. Mrs. Houck has said repeatedly, the children were screaming. They feared for their lives. You've got these agents demanding that he come out. They've got the gun, she said, pointing at the house and at them. He has offered to turn himself in. And this is who you go to terrorize. What's really interesting to me is this seems to directly contradict your own memorandum about the use of force at the Justice Department. You say officers may use only the force that is objectively reasonable to effectively control an incident. Are you telling me that in your opinion as Attorney General, it was objectively necessary to use 20 or 30 SWAT-style agents with long guns and ballistic shields for these people? What I'm saying is that decisions about how to go about this were made on the ground by FBI agents. So you're saying you don't know? I'm, I'm saying what I just said. That Which is that you're abdicating responsibility? I'm not abdicating responsibility. Then give me the answer. Is Do you think in your opinion, you are the Attorney General of the United States, you are in charge of the Justice Department, and yes, sir, you are responsible. The so F give me an answer. The FBI does not agree with your description. I'm not asking about the FBI. You are the Attorney General. Give me your answer. Do you think that it was objectively reasonable and they followed your guidelines in sending 20 to 30 armed agents to terrorize these people? Yes or no? The facts I have, which are those presented by the FBI, are not consistent with your description. So you think it was reasonable? I'm saying the facts are not as you describe. What, that the children weren't there? That there, wasn't, that there weren't long guns there? That facts. there weren't agents? What, wasn't, what, what do you dispute? What's the factual premise you dispute? FBI Be specific. FBI said they don't agree with your description of... Be um, specific. They don't agree with what? Of, of how many agents, of the agents who were there, and of what their roles were. They don't agree. Do you That's know the jury in this case acquitted Mr. Houck? So I'm sure you're aware. Do you know how long it took him? I, I am aware, and we respect the decision of the jury. Do you know how long it took him? I don't know. One hour. One hour. Philadelphia District Attorney declines to prosecute. The private suit's dismissed. You use an unbelievable show of force with guns that I just note liberals usually decry. We're supposed to hate long, long guns and assault-style weapons. You're happy to deploy them against Catholics and innocent children. Happy to. And then you haul them into court, and a jury acquits him in one hour. I just suggest to you that that is a disgraceful performance by your Justice Department and a disgraceful use of resources. I notice a pattern, though. The FBI field office in Richmond on the 23rd of January of this year issued a memorandum in which they advocated for, and I quote, the exploration of new avenues for tripwire and source development against traditionalist Catholics, it's their, their language, including those who favor the Latin mass. Attorney General, are you cultivating sources and spies in Latin mass parishes and other Catholic parishes around the country? No, the Justice Department does not do that. It does not um, um, do investigations based on religion. I saw the document you have. What did you do about it? It's appalling. It's appalling. I'm in complete agreement with you. I understand that the FBI has withdrawn it, and it's now looking into how this could ever have happened. How did it happen? That's what they're looking into. But I'm totally in agreement with you. That document is appalling. I'll tell you how it happened. The, this memorandum, which is supposed to be intelligent, cites extensively the Southern Poverty Law Center, which goes on to identify all of these different Catholics as being part of hate groups. Is, is this how the FBI, under your direction and leadership, is, is this how they do their intelligence work? They look, they look at left-wing advocacy groups to target Catholics? Is this what's going on? I mean, clearly it is. How is this happening? The FBI is not targeting Catholics, and, and as I've said, this is an, uh, an inappropriate memorandum, and it doesn't reflect the methods that the FBI is supposed to be using, should not be relying on any single organization without doing its own work. Let me just ask you, as my time expires here, a very direct question. How, how many informants do you have in Catholic churches across America? I don't know, and I don't believe we have any informants aimed at Catholic churches. We have a rule against uh, investigations based on First Amendment um, activity, and uh, uh, Catholic churches are obviously 
uh, First Amendment activity. Well, but I don't know the specific answer to your question. You, you don't know the specifics of anything, it seems, but apparently on your watch, this Justice Department is targeting Catholics, targeting people of faith, specifically for their faith views. And Mr. Attorney General, I'll just say to you, it's a disgrace. General, I want to explore the dangerous crisis at our southern border and your role in causing that crisis. Asylum traditionally is reserved for people who face things like religious persecution, persecution for their political beliefs, or violence because of their race or ethnicity. In June of 2021, you changed the department's asylum rules so that it could apply to individuals with significant gang violence in their home country. Is that 2021 interpretation still in place? Uh, it is. It reinstates a previous interpretation uh, that the department had had of the same um, asylum rules, yes. Okay. Do you know the most recent murder rate in Honduras? I'm sure it's enormously high. It's 36 per 100,000 people. What about Colombia? I, I don't know. 23 per 100,000. Guatemala? Again, I don't know, but I believe it's Seven, quite high. 17 per 100,000. What about Mexico, right across our southern border? I also think it's very high. 28 per 100,000. So I have to say, since you rewrote the rules of asylum based on the perceived degree of violence in these countries, I'm a little surprised you didn't know those, but let's look a little bit closer to home. Do you know the murder rate in New Orleans last year? Well, I don't, but I want to be clear, this wasn't based on violence. This is ba based on threats specifically to individuals, on gangs, where the country was unable to protect the person. That's what it was so, about. So, it wasn't about violence well, in general. Well, okay, well, you're partly responsible for protecting Americans, so let's see. Honduras, this government can protect its own people, except for 36 out of every 100,000 for murders. Guatemala, 17 out of every 100,000. The murder rate in New Orleans last year was 70 for every 100,000. What about St. Louis? Again, it's very high. I 68 think. per 100,000. What about Baltimore? Also very high. 58 per 100,000. Yeah. Should American citizens in places like New Orleans and Baltimore and St. Louis begin to seek asylum in countries like Honduras and Guatemala? under your asylum principles? Again, I'm saying that the principle here is protection of specific individuals who are being uh, uh, threatened by the gang and where the local um, uh, country is unwilling or unable to protect them. So, so is the United States government and the city governments of St. Louis and Baltimore and, and New Orleans unwilling or unable to protect the I don't believe that, I don't believe they're unwilling. They're well, doing everything that they can. We're supporting them in every way they can. The examples so, that you're talking about are ones where they are unwilling to protect from gangs. So, Mr. Attorney General, one of the reasons we have a crisis at our border where we have illegal aliens running to our Border Patrol, not away from our Border Patrol, is this interpretation of asylum. That anyone anywhere who lives in a dangerous or poor country can come here and seek asylum, as opposed to seeking it as is traditionally the case for things like persecution on religious belief or political practice. But Stan let's, let's, move on. let's move on, Mr. Attorney General. Right, I that's not the standard, I want to be clear. I Again, welcome, Attorney General. Um, I'm going to do something maybe a bit different. I'm going to try to find uh, consensus where we can, see how far we go. <clears throat> do you agree that the Wagner uh, organization associated with Russia should be a foreign terrorist organization under U.S. law? I, I think... Uh, uh, they are um, a uh, organization that's committing war crimes, uh, an organization uh, that's damaging the United States. I think they've already been designated as a trans uh, 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 yeah. as a um, um, criminal. Uh, yeah, 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 TCO. I'm trying to yeah. get that. I want to go up a notch. Are you okay with I that? I understand. Now, this is a the the way in which uh, determinations are made for with respect to terrorist organizations come through the State Department. They have to make determinations of what the consequence is for countries that are that have them in there. Do you object to me trying to make them a foreign terrorist? I think I, I don't object. I think though that I would defer in the end to the State Department on this. Yeah. Well, I I bet we'll all come together on that one. Uh, fentanyl. Fentanyl deaths uh, are more than gun and accident deaths combined in the United States. Did you know that? Yes, sir. I mean, this is, how would you describe the fentanyl problem in America? It's a horrible epidemic, okay. uh, but it's an epidemic that's been unleashed on purpose uh, by the Sinaloa um, yeah. and the new generation Jalisco cartels. Okay. Let's just stop and absorb that for a moment. It's a horrible epidemic. It kills more people than car wrecks <clears throat> and gun violence combined. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Uh, under current law, 
fentanyl loses its Schedule One status by the end of the year. You oppose that, I, I assume. I certainly do. Fentanyl, all fentanyl-related um, okay. um, drugs should be scheduled. Do you permanently support mandatory schedule. minimums for people dealing in fentanyl. I think we already have mandatory minimums for people. Do you think they in. should be increased? Um, I, I think we ha we have more than enough um, ability now to uh, attack this problem. Well, would you agree with me? Whatever we have is not working. Well, I, Whatever I, we're doing is not working. I, I agree with that because of the number of deaths yeah, that you so, pointed out. So, so the just keep an open mind that what we got on the books is not working. Um, if somebody gave a pill to another person with arsenic or ricin, could they be charged with murder because that will kill you? Absolutely. Okay, if somebody gave a uh, candy-shaped pill full of fentanyl, <clears throat> could they be charged with murder? Well, they, they can be uh, charged with uh, drug trafficking leading to death. I don't know. I don't think the statute says murder, okay. but it does say um, sp yep. specifically aims at that. We have brought prosecutions. Yep. I know having discussed so, this with uh, the U.S. Attorney in Colorado and the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. So Senator Cotton's got a proposal to dramatically increase the penalties associated with uh, fentanyl. I'd like to work with you and the chairman, if we could, to find a bipartisan solution to this problem to create deterrence that doesn't exist. Uh, Mexican drug cartels, should they be uh, designated foreign terrorist organizations under U.S. law? Yeah, I think it's the, the same answer I gave before. They are already uh, designated in any number of ways and sanctioned by the Treasury Would you oppose some of us trying to make them foreign terrorist organizations. I wouldn't oppose it, but again, um, I, I want to point out there are diplomatic concerns. We need the assistance of Mexico in this and designating. Is Mexico helping us effectively with our fentanyl problem? They are helping us, but they could do much more. There's no question about that. Well, if this is helping, I would hate to see what not helping looks like. Well, so they... the bottom line for me is they're not helping, and we need to up our game when it comes to fentanyl. Uh, Gitmo, are you familiar with, how, with the Gitmo prison. I, I haven't been there if that's what you're asking. No, other, I mean, other, but you know that we have foreign terrorists okay, yeah. housed there, is I that right? I certainly do. Do you agree with me that under the law of war, an enemy combatant properly designated can be held to the end of hostilities? Yes, that's uh, <laughs> the, the law of both of the circuit I stood, uh, I right. was on before, and the Supreme Court. Right. So do you agree with me that uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda is still at war with us? Yes, I do. So you agree that anybody associated with these organizations could be held indefinitely if they pre present a risk to the American people? I think they could. I think that the determination of whether they present a risk and uh, how they should be dealt with is a determination to be made by the Defense Department, and the yeah. Defense Department is making But legally, they can be held as long as they're a risk, and that could be for the rest of their lives, correct? I think that's right. It obviously depends on the facts of the I determination. I totally of agree. Do you believe Russia is committing crimes against humanity? I do. Okay, <clears throat> that's a pretty bold statement. Should we create an international court to support uh, charges of crime of aggression? Do you support that idea? So uh, the United States supports uh, um, um, what is now being developed in The Hague, uh, sponsored by Eurojust. Um, uh, looking into the possibility of creating that court. There are concerns that we have to take into account with respect to how that might deal with our own service members and other circumstances. We have to be sure that the appropriate guardrails are up, but we support any number of different ways in which um, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, and the potential for crimes against aggression are investigated. I'd like to work with you in that regard. I think that's something we could do. I would be happy um, to. When it comes to federal prisons, are you aware that 1,200 prisoners are requesting to be sent from a male prison to a female prison? Uh, I'm not, no. Okay. Uh, what is our policy when it comes to allowing a male prisoner to be transitioned into a female prison? I think uh, if you're generally asking the question of how um, uh, trans people are dealt with in the Bureau of Prisons, my understanding um, is that these are uh, determinations about um, uh, where they're placed or where people are placed in general have to do with individualized determinations regarding the security of that individual um, and the management of the prison. These are done on a case-by-case -case basis. That's my understanding. Are you aware of any policy guidelines that they use to make that determination? I think there is a policy guideline along the lines that I just said that, that they I are. Would, I would like for the Bureau of Prisons to send it to us. 
Are you concerned that if a biological male is sent to a female prison, that could be a risk to female prisoners? I think every uh, uh, person in prison has to be dealt with uh, with dignity and respect. Uh, that determinations of the safety questions you're talking about have to be made on an individualized basis uh, and not categorically. Okay. Finally, let's uh, end where we started, fentanyl. If this drug is killing more Americans than car wrecks and gun violence combined, do you believe that the policies we have today, in effect, are working? I've been in, involved in uh, the problem of uh, drug crime and drug trafficking for more than 40 years, including... That, that, that's not my question. It's not how long you've been involved. Are they working? They're, they are not stopping fentanyl from killing Americans, if that's the question you you're say asking. You say they're woefully inadequate to the task. We are putting all the resources that Congress provides to us into doing this. The DEA is doing, uh, we are starting at the precursor level when uh, precursors are sent from China to Mexico. We are then working oh, on attacking uh, the labs. I, I, my time is up, Mr. Chairman, they're not working. And we're gonna help you if you'll work with us to give you more tools. I hope you will meet us in the middle. Thank you. Happy to have more tools, Senator. Before recognizing another colleague, <clears throat> I want to apologize, and um, I refer Senator Kuhn, Senator Cotton. Mr. Attorney General, I want to explore the dangerous crisis at our southern border and your role in causing that crisis. Asylum traditionally is reserved for people who face things like religious persecution, persecution for their political beliefs, or violence because of their race or ethnicity. In June of 2021, you changed the department's asylum rules so that it could apply to individuals with significant gang violence in their home country. Is that 2021 interpretation still in place? Uh, it is. It reinstates a previous interpretation uh, that the department had had of the same um, asylum rules, yes. Okay. Do you know the most recent murder rate in Honduras? I'm sure it's enormously high. It's 36 per 100,000 people. No. What about Colombia? I, I don't know. 23 per 100,000. Guatemala? Again, I don't know, but I believe it's Seven, quite high. 17 per 100,000. What about Mexico, right across our southern border? I also think it's very high. 28 per 100,000. So I have to say, since you rewrote the rules of asylum based on the perceived degree of violence in these countries, I'm a little surprised you didn't know those, but let's look a little bit closer to home. Do you know the murder rate in New Orleans last year? I don't, but I want to be clear, this wasn't based on violence. This is ba based on threats specifically to individuals, on gangs, where the country was unable to protect the person. That's what it was about. So, it wasn't about violence well, in general. Well, okay. Well, you're partly responsible for protecting Americans. So let's see. Honduras, this government can protect its own people, except for 36 out of every 100,000 for murders. Guatemala, 17 out of every 100,000. The murder rate in New Orleans last year was 70 for every 100,000. What about St. Louis? Again, it's very high. I 68 think. per 100,000. What about Baltimore? Also very high. 58 per 100,000. Yeah. Should American citizens in places like New Orleans and Baltimore and St. Louis begin to seek asylum in countries like Honduras and Guatemala under your asylum principles? Again, I'm saying that the principle here is protection of specific individuals who are being uh, uh, threatened by the gang and where the local um, uh, country is unwilling or unable to protect them. So, so is the United States government and the city governments of St. Louis and Baltimore and, and New Orleans unwilling or unable to protect its I don't own believe th I don't believe they're unwilling. They're well, doing everything that they can. We're supporting them in every way they can. The examples so, you're talking about are ones where they are unwilling to protect from gangs. So, Mr. Attorney General, one of the reasons we have a crisis at our border where we have illegal aliens running to our border patrol, not away from our border patrol, is this interpretation of asylum. That anyone anywhere who lives in a dangerous or poor country can come here and seek asylum as opposed to seeking it as is traditionally the case for things like persecution on religious belief or political practice. But Stan let's, let's, move on. let's move on, Mr. Attorney General. Yeah, but I that's not the standard, I want to be clear. I want to come back to a question that Senator Cornyn started. You, your unprecedented memo in December of 2020 to direct your prosecutors not to pursue the most serious, readily provable offense. I have gotten numerous, numerous contacts in my office from your prosecutors who are shocked that you have overturned this decades-long bipartisan standard. You said this was about allocating resources. What what resources are you talking about? No prosecutor, I mean, no prosecutor was directed to not bring uh, a case again. In fact, your memo specifically says if they feel that it's not warranted, 
or, or only if the other offenses are not sufficient, they should not pursue what has been the standard for decades, I'm well, generations of U.S. attorneys and their I'm assistants. I'm well aware of the standard because I helped write the standard originally. When because the first it was a Carter administration first, standard, that's not right. specifically known for being tough on crime. Ex well, it was the first time the principles of prosecution were reduced to a book which explained what they were. It was included in it. Every uh, assistant U.S. attorney is able to use their discretion to bring these kinds of cases. No one's being directed to not do anything. You, you specifically said that they should not pursue the most serious readily provable offenses in cases where mandatory minimums are present because it's not warranted. You specifically said that. Uh, but I said... The, what, this, is manda what does mandatory mean? I'm trying to say that... Does it mean that prosecutors get a choice not to pursue it if you write the law in that way? The memorandum said that, that, that uh, uh, cases of violent crime, which is specifically what you're asking me, are ones where, in fact, it's most likely that they should be bringing the highest and uh, it, mandatory minimums. Is it your assertion here that... Drug trafficking is not a violent crime. No, it's and built also, on an entire foundation and edifice of violence. Yes, and it includes an exception in, in the same memorandum we're talking about for significant drug trafficking um, as well as for violent crime. So That's let's, right. Let's get your specific answer. I, I wrote it down here. I was so surprised by it. You said to Senator Cornyn, this is about allocating resources. Yeah. What, what resources are we allocating? If one of your assistant U.S. attorneys has some criminal low life who could be charged with 12 offenses, but they don't charge the two most serious readily provable offenses because of your memorandum. They're still charged with 10 offenses. They have to go to a grand jury. They have to go to trial. They have to have a pre-sentencing report. They have to have a sentencing hearing. How is that conserving resources that you don't charge them with the most serious readily provable offenses that would lock these low lives up for the longest time possible. The low lives that you're worried about and have expressed worried about, the drug, large drug traffickers, the violent criminals, they are to be charged to the max. I ask again, what resources were you talking about? You said to Senator Corn specifically, it was about allocating resources. What resources? These include our investigators and how much we have to investigate in order to establish the uh, requirements for mandatory minimums, the prosecutors who have to prove those cases, the judges who have to try those cases, and the jails that have to hold those cases, uh, those individuals for well, longer if terms. Jails are, I don't see how jails could be a problem. You only have 158,000 prisoners now. Ten years ago, it was 219,000. Do you need more prisons? Well, I, I think that... Uh, Kenny's an appropriator. I bet he could get you more well, prisons. I think that many of the senators have complained that the jails are too, too uh, filled, uh, that they're uh, over crowded, that we're not able to provide the level of protection and security for uh, guards and for prisoners uh, that we would like. But that is not what this is about. Um, again, I want to be clear, the memorandum was crystal clear that um, they are to charge um, uh, the most serious provable offense in exam cases involving violent crime and drug trafficking. Okay, l let's turn to another example of you overriding Congress's will. Congress has repeatedly decided to impose stiffer penalties for crack cocaine than powder cocaine, done originally at the request of members of the Congressional Black Caucus, voted for by, by senators like Senator Durbin, the chairman of this committee. Ten years ago, they made change to that. They specifically kept the ratio higher, and they didn't make it retroactive. Now, you have directed your prosecutors, when they are dealing with crack cocaine, to charge it as if it was powder cocaine, something that this Congress has repeatedly refused to do, which we refused to do as recently as December when Senator Booker tried it on the floor and I blocked it. How do you explain overriding Congress's decision on this distinction between crack and powder cocaine to suit your own policy preferences? The longstanding rule um, is that the uh, Department of Justice uses its discretion in which charges to bring. Um, regardless of which ones are available, which ones are to, to bring, every bit of evidence we have is that there's no difference between powder and crack. Uh, Governor Hutchinson testified those are to that fact. Those are, legislative, those are legislative decisions. Those are not prosecutorial decisions. If this Congress wants to do it, maybe it will one day, and maybe I'll be outvoted. But those are legislative decisions. Those are not prosecutorial decisions. You said at your confirmation hearing that you had to follow the law as it was written, that the executive branch could not rewrite the law. What you're doing is rewriting the law. It's not a single prosecutor out on the front lines making one decision. You're directing every federal prosecutor to override the law that has been written by Congress. We're using our discretion as to which charges to bring in which circumstances, which ones are appropriate. That's what we're doing. That's a longstanding history of prosecutorial discretion in the United States. Senator uh, Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Attorney General, hello. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, General, for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I, I read this somewhere. I don't remember who said it, 
but I wrote it, but I remember it. It was once observed that, that a parent who stops loving their children, if a parent stops loving their children, the children will not stop loving the parent. The children will stop loving themselves. Um, I know we can agree that uh, we should encourage parents to be involved in their kids' lives. Absolutely. And I'm sure we can agree that we should encourage parents to uh, make their kids do their homework. Yes, although there's sometimes some resistance to that. Right, right. And to make sure they get sleep at night so they can be ready for school. Yes. Um, here's what I'm, I've always been confused about. Didn't you understand the chilling effect that it would have to parents when you issued uh, your directive, when you directed your criminal divisions and your counterterrorism divisions to, um, to investigate parents who were angry at school boards and administrators during COVID? So, Senator, if you'd just give me a moment to put the full context, I did not do that. I did not issue any memorandum directing the investigation of parents who were concerned about their children. Quite to the contrary, the memorandum that you're talking about says at the very beginning of the memorandum that vigorous public debate is protected by the First Amendment. And the kind of concerns that you're talking about are, uh, as expressed by parents are, of course, completely protected. The memorandum was aimed at violence and threats of violence against a whole host of school personnel. It was not aimed at parents making complaints to their school board. And it, it came in the context of a whole series of other kinds of violent threats uh, and violence against other public well, well, officials. Let's walk through this. Um, your directive to your criminal division and your counterterrorism -terror division came in a response to a letter from the National School Boards Association, did it not? In part to the letter and in part to news reports of right. violence and And, and the, the National School Board Association um, said these parents ought to be investigated under the Patriot Act as potential domestic terrorists. And you'll notice, Senator, that I said nothing like that. I understand, that in but my that's mind. what the letter said. There, there was a reference to that in the letter, right. something I disagree with. And your employees helped them write the letter, didn't they? I don't know anything to suggest that that's true. Uh, no, I think I don't. it is true. Well, and the White House helped them write that letter, didn't they? I, do, I don't know. I have no knowledge about that, but certainly I don't know anything about my employees and so, helping write that letter. So you get this letter from the National School Board Association asking you to investigate parents that your employees helped write and that the White House helped write, and you issue a directive to your criminal division and to your counterintelligence or counterterrorism division to start investigating parents who are angry. What did you think was going to happen? Say again, Senator, that I, my, nothing in my memorandum says to investigate parents who are angry, quite the opposite. It says that the First Amendment protects that kind of vigorous debate. The only thing we wanted was for an assessment to be made out in the field about whether federal assistance was needed to prevent violence and threats of violence. Well, one of your field, that's not the way your, your, your department implemented your directive. One of your field offices actually opened an investigation. You set up a, a website and a hotline to report parents. And yeah, there, I, a state, I don't think we didn't set up a specific hotline about this. This was a, a reference to the Democratic FBI's Party hotline. official contacted you. They said uh, that some Republicans were inciting violence by expressing public displeasure with school districts' vaccine mandates. And one of your field offices opened an investigation, which is a permanent part of their record. 
I, uh, Senator, I, I don't know anything about the specific thing that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, they, used to really say, they used to say in high school this is going to be on your permanent record. I don't believe there is any such thing um, uh, with respect oh, I, to, the, I to this. I think there is at the FBI general, and oh. you and I both know there is. There, there was a lady and in, in, uh, a mom in Michigan. She has a special needs kid, and the kid was doing pretty well. And she got upset with her local school board over its closures and and uh, virtual learning policies, and she went to the meeting. And and she made an intemperate comment. She 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 accused them of being a bunch of Nazis. Um, why would the FBI open an investigation of her? Again, I don't know anything about the specifics of the case, but accusing people of being Nazis, while I find bad. It's certainly not criminal. It's totally protected no. by the First Amendment. I mean, I and I've said that over and over again. This is not the first time we've discussed not, this. That's not what your department did. Well, I, 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 this is about the third time I'm being asked the, about the same memorandum, and each time I've said, and I hope that the senators would go ahead and advise their constituents in the same way, that this is not what we do. We are not in any way trying to interfere with parents making complaints but, but, about the education of their children. But don't you understand, General, and, 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 and I, I, I believe you, but don't you understand that this looks like you were just giving in to the teachers' unions and politicizing the disagreement, the honest disagreements? I mean, we only, as a result of some of our school board policies, we only experienced the largest learning loss for our kids in modern history. Don't you think parents had a right to be upset? Absolutely. Instead of, what is a, I mean, you, you implemented, what's a threat tag? Uh, I didn't implement the threat tag. What you're talking about there is a, a part of uh, internal FBI operations. Yeah. So, you, as far you, as I, I can. You directed your folks, though, to open threat tags on these parents I, I and, and, and investigate them. Yeah, I did not uh, uh, direct that. My understanding from testimony by the FBI is that when somebody makes a complaint and it involves, uh, 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 if somebody uh, gives a tip that a, a, a school official is being threatened, then there's, uh, in order to uh, 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 look at trends, they mark it as a as a uh, uh, tip involving a school official. They make the, have the same set of uh, threat tags with respect to a complaint that suggests somebody is making a threat against a Supreme Court justice. These aren't complaints. These are tips that of violence or threats of violence. A threat tag on a parent for being concerned at a school board meeting? It's not on the parent. It's not on whoever... It's on uh, to indicate that a threat was made against, or at least alleged that a threat was made against, a school board member or a school official or a teacher or a school. Some of these turned out to be bomb threats. Senator, so, uh, Senator Kennedy, we're going to have a second round of questioning. On behalf of I uh, Chairman Durbin, who has gone to vote, I'm going to call on. Uh, you're, you're blaming it on Durbin, huh? <laughs> I understand. I apologize for I going I take over. full responsibility. Thank you, General. Oh, I told just to alert the members and Senator Cruz is next. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, welcome. Thank you. As you know, as I observed at your confirmation hearing, you had built a long record on the Federal Court of Appeals and a reputation of being relatively nonpartisan. And so I had hopes that your tenure as Attorney General would continue that record. I have to say I'm deeply disappointed in what the last two years have shown. In my judgment, the Department of Justice has been politicized to the greatest extent I've ever seen in this country. And it has done a discredit to the Department of Justice, to the FBI, and to the administration of law in this country. Let me start with a simple question. General Garland, is it a federal crime to protest outside of a judge's home with the intent of influencing that judge as to a pending case? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but I also want to at least respond to your characterization of the department, which sure. I 
vigorously disagree with. I believe the men and women of the department pursue their work every single day in a nonpartisan and an appropriate General way. General Garland, there are thousands of men and women who do that. And I'll tell you, I hear from prosecutors at the Department of Justice. I hear from agents at the FBI who are angry that it is treated as the enforcement arm for the DNC instead of upholding the law in a fair and even-handed manner. So you are right. There are thousands of men and women that are, that are doing the job, but it is the political leadership that you're responsible for. So you just said, yes, it's a crime to protest at the home of a judge. Same goes for jurors, by the way, with the intent of in influencing a case. But in the wake of the leak of the Dobbs decision, when rioters descended at the homes of six Supreme Court justices, night after night after night, you did nothing. The department did nothing. When extremist groups like Ruth sent us and Jane's Revenge openly organized campaigns of harassment at the homes of justices, you sat on your hands. When these same groups posted online information about where the justices worship or their home addresses or where their kids went to school, you again sat on your hands and did nothing. Your failure to act to protect the safety of the justices and their families was an obvious product of political bias. You agree with Roe versus Wade. You disagree with the Dobbs decision. And the Department of Justice under this president was perfectly happy to refuse to enforce the law and allow threats of violence. And as you know, those threats finally materialized with Nicholas Roski, a 26-year-old man from California who traveled across the country, was arrested outside the home of Justice Kavanaugh, armed with a handgun, a knife, and burglary tools. And he said he came there to kill Justice Kavanaugh because he was enraged by the leaked opinion. Now, of course, you're prosecuting that individual for attempted murder. But did you bring even a single case to enforce this law or did the Department of Justice decide this law doesn't apply if it's harassing justices for an opinion we don't like? When the Dobbs uh, draft was leaked, I did something no attorney general in the history of the department had ever done before. For the first time in history, I ordered United States Marshals 24-7 to defend every uh, residents of every justice. General Garland, as a judge, you're familiar with asking counsel I'm to answer an a question. I am answering. Has the Department of Justice enforced this statute? Have you brought a single case against any of these protesters threatening the judgment justices under 18 U.S.C. Section 1507? Have you brought even one? Senator, you asked me whether I sat on my hands, and quite the opposite. I sent okay, 70 me, United States Marshals. Let me try again. To and let Have me, you, has the Department of Justice brought even a single case under this statute? It's a yes-no question. It's not a give a speech on the other things you did. The job of the United States Marshals is to defend the lives so of the justices. So the answer is no. It's to defend the lives of the justices, and that's our number one priority. They have Why are you unwilling to say no? The answer is no. You know it's no. I know it's no. Everyone in this, in this hearing room knows it's no. You're not willing to answer a question. Have you brought a case under this statute, yes or no? As far as I know, we haven't, and what we have done is defended the lives of the justices with so over how do 70 you decide, U.S. Marshals. How do you decide which criminal statutes the, the DOJ enforces and which one it doesn't? The United States Marshals know that they have full okay, you, I recognize you want to give a separate speech. No, I don't want how to give How do you decide which statutes you enforce and which ones you don't? The marshals on scene make that determination in light of the priority of defense. The marshals do not make a determination over whether to prosecute you. The attorney general make a determination, and you spent 20 years as a judge, and you're perfectly content with justices being afraid for their children's lives. <laughs> And you did nothing to prosecute it. Let's shift that, to another is, area. Can I answer the question? You, no, the, you the cannot. General, you have refused to answer the I question. I am answering your question. The how attorney you general choose, does not decide whether to how arrest. How did you choose not to, not to enforce this statute? The marshals on scene. The marshals don't make that decision. They do make the decision of whether to make to an prosecute arrest. prosecute someone? No, they don't. If they make, a, uh, if they make an arrest. Marshals do not if, have prosecution. If they authority. make an arrest, right, then it goes to the marshals. Let's change topics because our, our time is limited. We've also seen across the country violent attacks as pregnancy centers by similar left-wing terrorist groups, including one, one graffiti of a, of a firebomb building, said Jane was here. 
There have been attacks all over the country. And yet, the Department of Justice has not brought these violent criminals to justice. You contrast that. If you're a violent criminal and you attack a crisis pregnancy center, that is not a priority in the Biden Department of Justice. Contrast that to Mark Houck, who's a pro-life activist. He's a sidewalk counselor. And he had an altercation with someone who allegedly Interf interfered with his son's personal space and threatened his, his son, and he pushed him. Now, in an ordinary world, pushing someone would be maybe a sim simple misdemeanor assault, but not under the Biden Department of Justice. If you're a pro-life activist, what can you expect? Well, in this instance, according to Mr. Houck's wife, two dozen agents clad in body armor and ballistic helmets and shields and a battering ram showed up at his house pointing rifles at his family. Why do you send two dozen agents in body armor to arrest a sidewalk counselor who happens to be pro-life, but you don't devote resources to, count pe to, to prosecute people who are violently firebombing crisis pregnancies? It is a priority of the department to prosecute and investigate and find the people who are doing those fire bombings. They are doing it at night and in secret, so, and we have, found two, we have found one group which we did prosecute. You we found are, one. How many have there been? How many attacks? There, there have been, been a lot, and if you have any information specifically as to who those people are, we would be glad, did, would did be glad to have that. Did you personally authorize 20 agents going to Mr. Houck's house, and he uh, offered to turn himself in through counsel, but you didn't want that. The Department of Justice wanted to make a show of it. Did you personally authorize it? And do you want to apologize to Mr. Mrs. Houck and her seven children for being terrorized? The decisions about how to do that are made at the level of the uh, FBI agents on scene. Did and you know about it? I did not know about it until uh, the way you're describing it. And my understanding is the FBI disagrees with that description. Was it a Senator's mistake? time has expired. I'm going to allow the witness to respond to any of the questions that were asked. Was it a mistake? I'm going to chair the committee, Senator. I'm sorry you're not. I'm you said you'd allow him to respond. I've repeated the question I asked, which is, was it a mistake to send you, 20 you, agents to arrest him at had, the crack of dawn? You had your time and you more You just said any, you're going to allow him to respond. You just said, I'm going to allow him to respond to the question. So I repeated the question. Was it a mistake? You that was the, the pending you question. You want to ask? I'll ask the questions. I want That's to the ask. question I had already asked. Well, you just said you'd let him respond. I'm going to let him respond right Good. now. Please don't interrupt him. Thank you. The decisions about how to do tactical arrests are made by the FBI agents in the field. Uh, the FBI has uh, publicly stated that it disagrees with the description you gave of what happened in that example. I don't. I, that's the best I can answer. At this point, we're going to. Um, FBI Director Ray couldn't answer this at the time for reasons that are not his fault, but, um, I hope you'll say the same thing if I can't answer it. Right <laughs> well, I think the coast is clear now. Um, Michael Sussman, you know who I'm talking about? Uh, he, he was a defendant in a special counsel, uh, uh prosecution. Case. Right, right. He was with the private law firm Perkins Coey. Uh, which is the main counsel for the uh, National Democratic Party. He had a special badge to get him into the uh, Justice Department and or the FBI building. Why did he have that special badge? Uh, I'm afraid I also don't know anything about this. I assume uh, from um, the reference that this is something that Mr. Durham was investigating as part of his investigation. No, I don't think he investigated the badge. Uh, I know he was investigating Mr. Sussman. This goes back to, I think, 2020. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Could you find out for me? At the time, the, tri the, the, the trial was in progress, and Mr. Ray couldn't answer, but the trial's over. And I'd like to know why Mr. Sussman, a private citizen, had a special badge to get him into the FBI and the Department of Justice, and if there are other people out there who have special badges. Um, well, on, on the particular question about Sussman, I think we're going to have to wait until uh, Mr. Durham uh, finishes his report, which should be relatively soon. I certainly don't in any way want to interfere of course. with him, and he's the one who would know the answer to that. 
On the more general question, I can certainly ask my team to look into how lawyers have special badges. Would you? That'd be great. Thank you. I want to ask you about uh, the China Initiative, uh, which, as you know, was started under the Department of Justice to counter the transfer of scientific research and intellectual property to, um, to China. Um, at any time, did the investigations initiated under the China Initiative uh, by the Department of Justice stem from racism? Uh, I have no evidence to suggest that they did. Okay. At any time, did the investigations pursuant to the China Initiative and begun by the Department of Justice, um, were they ever inappropriately undertaken? Again, I, I have no evidence to suggest that they did. Obviously, some of the cases resulted in acquittals or dismissals by court, but the courts, but that doesn't mean that they were uh, inappropriately begun. Okay. Um, did any of the cases that the department initiated under the China initiative um, um, reflect the ancestry of the defendant charged more than the seriousness of the allegations? I'm not, not sure exactly what you're asking, but it, it sounds like it's the same question and I would give the same answer. I don't have any reason to believe that anything was in, done inappropriately or based on ancestry or based on discrimination in those cases. Okay. Do you agree with Chris Ray that China is the biggest threat to U.S. security? Yeah, I, uh, and I think the Director of National Intelligence also testified that it's our okay. uh, most dangerous uh, um, uh, near well, peer. Uh, well, let me ask you this, because I've got 11 seconds. I'm sorry? I've got 11 seconds left. Why did you get rid of the China Initiative then? Yeah, so um, as you know, um, the, uh, the new Assistant Attorney General uh, for the uh, National Security uh, uh, Division uh, gave a long description of what was done. Um, this was all folded into one uh, uh, nation state initiative. Uh, we don't know sometimes when there's a cyber attack, when there's another kind of attack, which country is attacking us. And I believe he thought it was most efficient for us to focus our attention on the four main uh, hostile uh, state actors. China now in, in, in many ways uh, affiliating with Russia. Which S some of your people said it was racist. I, I, I didn't say that. I don't know who my people are who said that. Okay. Well, if I had more time, I, we, can, we can find out here. <laughs> Help me out, Senator Manchin. <laughs> um, Senator Kennedy, there will be a second round of yes, questions if yes, you would like to stay. Yes, ma'am. Senator Manchin. There's no way I could fill in for you, sir. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. What Thank you, Attorney General. Um, on September the 30th, 2023, there was a FOIA request made regarding the ongoing attacks against pro-life organizations. And um, <clears throat> under federal law, as I understand, uh, federal agencies have 20 working days to respond to FOIA requests. Is that not correct? Yes, that's the law. Okay, great. Um, to date, the Department of Justice has not complied with the request, and I have the request in front of me. It was sent to you and to the FBI. It says um, a FOIA communic um Communications pertaining to the ongoing attacks against pro-life organizations. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent to enter this into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Um, it's been nearly six months. Why has the Department of Justice not complied with federal law on this request? I mean, this is, this is a request sent by multiple entities by Advancing American Freedom, Concerned Women for America, Heritage Action, Family Research Council, all joined together on this FOIA request, and it has gone unanswered. Why? So, uh, again, I obviously don't know that particular request. We get thousands and thousands of FOIA requests, and some take longer to answer than others. Mm -hmm. uh, this one sounds in part to be asking about ongoing investigations, and, of course, that requires redaction of information to protect investigations so that the investigations succeed. But I don't know the specifics, and I'll be happy to have my staff get in touch with you. I would appreciate an answer to this FOIA request. Okay, um, <clears throat> on that note, in, um, uh, there's another FOIA request that was sent by a concerned citizen in Washington, D.C., and that concerned citizen 
requested access to records concerning data related to the prosecution of homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson that occurred in Washington, D.C. in the last five years. The response to that request was denied. And it says, <clears throat> the um, United States attorney informed you that it does not maintain records such as those that you described. The United States attorney in Washington, D.C. does not maintain records on the prosecution of violent crime in Washington, D.C. That stuns me. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know the specifics here. I'd be happy to have staff get back to you. Um, um, obviously, some of the statistics uh, only the Metropolitan Police Department has. I, I don't mean arrest. I mean prosecution. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. And, and I'll be uh, okay. To can back. I get your commitment that we can have those records, uh, uh, the prosecution yeah, yeah. Of, of violent crime in D.C.? Yeah, you'll have, you have my commitment that my staff will get in touch with yours and with the U.S. Attorney's Office to find out what the, what the holdup here is. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, one last question for you regarding firearm tracing. In your belief, is every firearm trace that is conducted by ATF linked to an actual crime? Well, when, when you say every, um, it's mm -hmm. always a, a potential problem. The, the normal way in which tracing mm -hmm. happens is that a police department uh, submits a request based on a gun found at a crime scene. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether there is something outside of that, but that's typically what happens state and local police or federal law enforcement uh, gets a gun at a crime scene and then uh, tr tries to trace back uh, where it was purchased from. Okay. Uh, last year, Representative Cloud from Texas sent a letter regarding firearm traces, and part of the response to that letter said, uh, the NTC only traces crime guns, and every trace must be identified as such by the requester selecting the appropriate crime code. And we requested in a follow-up letter, please provide a list of all the crime codes an agency must choose from when a trace is requested. Uh, <clears throat> so far, we've gotten no response to that letter. It's been a year. Uh, will you commit that you will respond to that letter again I'll, with the crime codes? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I will certainly commit that my staff will get, get the letter from you and uh, will then contact uh, ATF and find out what the holdup is. Okay, great, because I can personally attest as a federal firearms licensee myself being the recipient of trace requests, there are multiple traces that have nothing to do with crime whatsoever. Whether it's a gun that was lost, whether it was a gun that was sent back to the manufacturer for repair and we get a trace on it, whether it's a gun that's voluntarily turned into a law enforcement agency for a temporary hold that we get a trace on, um, <clears throat> or whether a gun was owned by an employee that currently has it and we got a trace on that gun, which I don't understand. So I really don't understand how the tracing process works, and I really want to understand that. I think you're entitled to an explanation, and I'm going to ask uh, the people from ATF to get together with your staff and Great. you with an explanation. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Mr. Morelli. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Attorney General, uh, as I asked my first round of... Um, the second vote has been called for anyone who... Um, wants to go vote. I am going to go vote. I'm going to turn the gavel over to Senator Peters and Senator Britt, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Mr. General, for being in front of us today. I appreciate the topics that have been brought up from drug cartels to Mexico and the DEA to the fentanyl poisoning communities all across this nation to drug use and addiction. I stand ready to be a productive part of those conversations and work to move our nation forward, keeping our communities safe and strong. Mr. General, I want to ask you about some questions when you testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee a couple of weeks ago. I am um, a big believer, and I've heard this all over the state of Alabama as I've traveled. People want justice to be blind. They believe that is a foundational building block of our nation, and until we restore that trust and confidence, um, you know, people are, are worried about the direction our nation will go. So you testified several weeks ago before the Senate Judiciary Committee and fielded a number of questions from committee members regarding DOJ's failure to prosecute any individuals who were involved in the illegal protest outside the homes of multiple Supreme Court justices in the aftermath of the leaked Dobbs opinion. As you are well aware, 18 U.S.C. 1507 makes it a crime to picket 
or parade near a residence occupied by a judge. It says, with the intent of influencing any judge, juror, witness, or court officer in the discharge of his duty. In answering the questions from multiple members of the committee, you repeatedly asserted that DOJ's failure to bring any charges under Section 1507 was due to the fact that the U.S. Marshals who were protecting the homes of the justices failed to make any arrest under that statute. You said, quote, the marshals have been advised and they know, and the marshals on the ground, they have full authority to arrest people under any federal statute, including that federal statute, end quote. That was in direct reference to section 1507. You went on to say, the attorney general does not decide whether to arrest the marshals on the scene. They do make the decision of whether to arrest. After your appearance before the Judiciary Committee, we obtained copies of the slide deck that was used to train and prepare the marshals for their protective detail at the homes of the justices. Those training materials show that the marshals likely didn't make any arrest under Section 1507 for a pretty simple reason. They were actively discouraged from doing so. As you can see on the slide behind me, the marshals were explicitly told to avoid, unless absolutely necessary, any criminal enforcement action involving the protester. The slides went on to say, they explicitly state that making arrest and initiating prosecutions was not the goal of the marshals' presence at the homes of the justices, and the not was actually italicized and underlined. The next slide directs the marshals not to engage in protest-related enforcement actions beyond those that were strictly and immediately necessary and tailored to ensure the physical security of the justices. If you'll see in the next slide here, it discourages the marshals from making arrest under any section 1507 by asserting that there may be a First Amendment right to harass the families of the judges and by concluding that any arrest of protesters are a last resort to prevent physical harm of the justices. Mr. Attorney General, yes or no, were you at any point before your testimony in front of the Judiciary Committee aware of these training materials or the fact that the marshals had been heavily discouraged from making arrest under Section 1505? I think this is the first time I've seen the slide deck, and frankly, from here, I can't make it out, uh, for which I apologize for my eyesight, but I can't, can't make it out. Um, what I said uh, before was correct there. First and principal job is to protect the lives and property of the of the um, of the um, members of the court. Um, and as I said at the time, um, first attorney general has ever ordered the marshals to protect the residences uh, of the justices and to protect them 24/7. Yes. Uh, that's their principal responsibility. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that uh, other that uh, they are in any way precluded from. Um, uh, bringing other kinds of arrests. So thank you so much, Mr. Attorney General. I do have another question for in a few moments, but when you say they were given the full authority to arrest people violating Section 1507, I would ask, will you take a look at these slides, these materials, dig into them? It is clear that these marshals were given directives that limited, that narrowed the scope. Of course, we all want the physical safety, um, the physical safety of our Supreme Court justice is paramount, and we thank you for sending those marshals there. 1507, though, actually is more all-encompassing than that narrowly tailored, objective, uh, narrowly tailored objective, and it says picketing or parading near a building or housing, if you're doing it with the intent to interfere with, obstruct, or impede the administration of justice or influencing any judge in the discharge of his duty. It's clear when you look at these slides that the marshals were not given those directives. I would like for you to take a look at that, and if you agree with that statement, um, I'd like for you to amend your testimony to the Judiciary committee. Well, I, I, there's nothing for me to amend because, I've, as I said, I've never seen those slides before. I, d I know I need to yield my time. Um, it, it's clear the marshals were given a different directive, and I would ask you to look into that, please. I will. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Britt. Attorney General Garland, good to see you here uh, today, and uh, thank you uh, for your... Manchin. There's no way I could fill in for you, sir. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know whether that's good or That's bad. a good one. That's a good one. Uh, General Garland, thank you for your service. I really appreciate all the wonderful service you've given our country. Uh, I'd like to say first about West Virginia. You know, we've had, we're home to NASA, to the Customs and Border Protection Bureau of Fiscal Services. We have the CGIS 
the FBI Center. The people there are concerned. They're hearing rumors there's going to be some cutbacks and movement of personnel and sieges. If you could check that out. That's been tremendously, uh, I understand, a tremendously effective agency that's been working there. And uh, uh, Director Gray has just come down and spent some time there. We went together through it. And all of a sudden, we've heard that uh, the sieges may have some loss of jobs or transfer of jobs. And the people are they're hearing these rumors. So if you could help me relieve them of that fear, it would be very much appreciated. Also, the Hazleton prison we have in the prison system, Hazleton, has had some violent crimes there, but they're having a tremendous problem with shortages of uh, personnel. And there's a law, and we, we've directed money to be spent there, and it's been in your budget. But for some reason, they're not able to either find employees that will want to work there or the environment or whatever it may be. And I would hope that you would look into that personally because that's been a very important system for the Bureau of Prisons, but it's been very troubled. Yeah, this, this question um, of uh, retention uh, and hiring has been a big problem in all the prisons. Yeah. And as I mentioned, we, are, we have a, um, a new program, which we worked out with the Office of Personnel Management to allow us to provide incentives for retention and hiring. Of well, we need it is a maximum security thing, and it's, it's, they get some pretty, rough, for, some pretty rough characters come through there. And uh, I, uh, I, I meet with the staff quite frequently, and they have very much concerns. They'd love to have your attention and your help. Um, the drug epidemic, I can't speak enough about the problems. We're ground zero as West Virginia. And in that situation, that scenario we have, we know, as you said, the precursors are coming from China. Is there no way that we can do anything to stop that or have China be responsible, knowing that it's been going into the cartels for the manufacturing of fentanyl? Uh, we know what's happening. And is there any chance that all the United States government can just say, hey, enough's enough? I mean, uh, we've lost more people to these overdoses in any war we've ever fought, and to sit back and do nothing, can we spend special ops, special forces to match up with the, uh, with the Mexican government if they have a determination to do something? If not, can we, for the benefit of America, do it on our own? Can we go in there, take care of the problem, and root it out if they're not going to do it? Uh, well, let me just start with the uh, drug problems in West Virginia. As I, I, I hope uh, you were advised, we just um, arrested an uh, organization. It was a big, it's a very largest, big, op yeah. Yeah, the largest methamphetamine seizure in West Virginia history, you, uh, you, well over 200 pounds. You have a good man there, U.S. Attorney Will Thompson. He used to be a federal judge. I mean, he's just a wonderful person, yeah. right person, did a heck of a job. So we're doing the right thing yes, in you West are. Virginia, and we've got well, we a lot more to do. But we got to stop the flow of the drugs coming absolutely. in. Absolutely, and I think that one of the things we have to do with respect to the precursors are to uh, identify and then sanction the um, uh, uh, manufacturers in China, and then interdict. But quickly, is there anything we can do with China suppliers and also the producers down in Mexico, and take it upon ourselves to go after Mexican cartels if the Mexican government won't do it? Well, I'm going to leave that question to the diplomats in the Defense Department. Uh, okay. for, as far as we're concerned, the DEA is working with them, um, trying to encourage them to work more together uh, with respect to uh, tackling the cartels. This is a whole-of-government yeah. effort. We just sent the Deputy Attorney gotcha. General, uh, the Deputy of uh, Homeland Security, uh, the Deputy National Security Advisor, all just went down again to Mexico to meet with uh, um, uh, the president sure. and their security ministers uh, to try to my, encourage them more on these joint yeah. operations. My final question, sir, is concerning Ukraine, and I know you just made a visit there. I've called that the most just war that we've ever been in in my lifetime because we're there for the right reason, trying to defend the freedoms and democracies that these countries desire when they have these unwanted attacks and this, this absolute horrific attack by uh, Putin. Um, can you discuss the department's work to hold a Russian accountable for the war crimes committed? Can you also provide an updated department's klepto capture work to seize illicit, drug, illicit Russian assets for the benefit of the Ukrainian people? And then finally, uh, they've made, I understand Ukraine's made tremendous progress in tackling their corruption uh, within its society, which has been systemic. Uh, can you discuss some of the progress that's been made? So yeah. first, I guess you could start with, if you can, the Russian war crimes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get you the numbers separately so sure. as to not to take the time. But uh, the purpose of this visit of mine uh, was to meet with President Zelensky and with the prosecutor general, as well as the prosecutor generals of all the surrounding countries, all of whom are participating in uh, war crimes investigations. 
uh, Prosecutor General has some 40,000 war crimes already registered. Uh, the Justice Department is providing forensic help on the ground in Ukraine to evaluate uh, the, the crime scenes. Uh, we, we're about to put a uh, prosecutor uh, embedded with the Prosecutor General in Kyiv. Um, we have stood up a um, uh, IT for them using some of what we learned in our various big case, digital case investigations here because everybody in Ukraine has an, an iPhone and there's a, millions and millions of di digital images of these war crimes as they were occurring. So we're, we're putting that all together. Um, we are supporting um, efforts in The Hague um, um, for a tribunal uh, that will be capable of um, uh, trying the war criminals. Um, and I've assigned Eli Rosenbaum, who is the head of our Nazi uh, hunting org, uh, um, entity in the Justice Department, to lead uh, what we call our War Crimes Accountability uh, Task Force. So that's on, on that side. Um, on the um, klepto capture, um, again, here I met again with a number of the justice ministers when I was in Ukraine. Uh, it was my second visit. Um, and here we are uh, in enormous agreement among the EU countries uh, to, to uh, locate, uh, freeze, and seize the assets of R Russian oligarchs um, who are facilitating this uh, unlawful and unprovoked attack. Um, we have been quite successful um, in the amount of money that we've seized, um, and I've already um, uh, certified a transfer of some of that money to Ukraine, Ukraine for rebuilding, which is the first time we've ever been able to do that kind of forfeiture. On the uh, corruption uh, front, I, I've spoken heart to heart with the Prosecutor General along with our uh, ambassador. Uh, we've gotten um, made clear to them that our own willingness to continue to provide funds depends on them being sure that the funds go to what they should be going to and that uh, uh, to not be used uh, uh, with respect to corruption. Um, this is also a, a, a condition for ultimate admission to the EU. They are seized with this. Um, uh, they are very concerned to be sure that they eliminate that issue. And as you probably know about, maybe a month before I went to Ukraine, they arrested quite a number of high-level yeah. uh, Ukrainian officials on that guard. We'll get you more information on the specifics, of, for example. Thank you, sir. I'm so sorry, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Manchin. Um, I'm a member, as is Senator Collins, of the Senate Select Committee, uh, Committee on Intelligence. Uh, we've been trying from, uh, for a number of weeks to get information from ODNI uh, related to uh, the classified documents in the presence or in the uh, location of uh, the presence of the former vice president, the former president, and the current president. According to ODNI, the Department of Justice is blocking them from providing the committee access to these documents. And the explanation is there's an appointment of a special counsel or the belief that it would otherwise compromise ongoing investigations. I would indicate that it is important for the Intelligence Committee to have access to these documents in our oversight capacity. And if there is, uh, based upon those documents, a need for risk mitigation activities, the Intelligence Committee is obligated to oversee uh, those activities. I also would indicate that uh, prior leadership of the department was able to reach an accommodating circumstance with the Intelligence Committee during the Russia investigation, so there is precedent. Um, General, is it your position that the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence cannot have access to those classified documents recovered from the homes of uh, or offices of President Biden and Trump and Vice President Pence? Uh, Senator, I, I, I'm surprised to hear that the uh, DNI uh, used the word blocking. Um, I don't want to. Let me look and see if there's quotes or whether that's <laughs> my word. I would say we are working well with them. Um, we believe that there is an accommodation possible. Um, we've been trying to work towards an accommodation. Uh, we do have to balance the concerns of uh, ongoing criminal investigations, uh, but we also well recognize the oversight responsibilities and obligations of the committee. Uh, and we intend to work out an arrangement that will accommodate those interests. We've been working with the Office of the uh, uh, Director of National Intelligence uh, towards that. We've been making quite a bit of progress recently, uh, and we expect to make uh, further progress. 
Uh, I hope that that progress can occur. I appreciate your answer that suggests that it will occur, and I hope it occurs in a timely fashion. I would indicate that the Intelligence Committee has no interest in uh, asking who, what, or when. Um, our interest is in oversight over the intelligence community. So I thank you for that answer. Let me turn to an experience I had about a week ago uh, in Mexico City. Uh, it was the Sunday before last. I met along with a number of my bipartisan and bicameral colleagues with President Lopez Obrador in Mexico, something you've done on several occasions. Um, I indicated to him that we had work to do in the United States on keeping guns from crossing the border going south, that we needed to do more to help prevent uh, and reduce the use of drugs in the United States. But if we, uh, as we pursued those um, plans of action, could the president, President Obador, do more to encourage and, in fact, insist I hope the word I would use is demand China to uh, eliminate the precursor chemicals coming from China to Mexico before they then cross the border to the United States. He indicated he would formally request that China take action to reduce exportation of fentanyl precursors. Uh, I think that is a promising development. Uh, the fact remains that cooperation between our two countries on law enforcement matters are extremely important. They are also significantly strained. Uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration remains severely constrained in its operational capabilities in Mexico. Um, excuse me while I turn the page slowly. One of the most significant lessons for me during that, uh, uh, that trip to Mexico was just how critical it is that we work to improve coordination and cooperation on law enforcement matters. Your first foreign visit to the, uh, as U.S. Attorney was to Mexico. You visited again there just uh, about two and a half months ago. Yesterday, NBC News reported that we may be close to a major agreement with the government of Mexico to address both the flow of fentanyl and illegal firearms trafficking. General, what is your assessment of the state of U.S.-Mexico cooperation on law enforcement? Uh, can you provide me any information about such a, a potential or near agreement? And um, uh, I, I guess I'll follow up depending upon what your answers are. Yeah. Um, so uh, I can't really say about a, a pending agreement um, um, uh, about those discussions, um, but I, I think I, I would uh, align myself with every single thing that you said uh, with respect to your visit to Mexico and, and your concerns. Uh, look, the way fentanyl in particular travels is it comes, uh, it begins with uh, precursor sales uh, from uh, China uh, to Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, um, it's made uh, into fentanyl, either uh, powder or pills, and crosses the border and then it's transmitted through our, our communities. Uh, the main runners are the uh, Jalisco um, uh, and the Sinaloa cartels. Uh, we need Mexico at every stage to act. We need Mexico to destroy the labs, uh, um, with, uh, with respect to which we've had some success. The last time I, I went to Mexico, right before I went, they destroyed major labs. Uh, we need them to crack down on the cartels. We need them uh, to crack down on the precursor uh, purchases of precursor chemicals by Mexican companies and the sales by the Chinese. Uh, likewise, we need to um, uh, 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 put as much pressure on China as we can uh, to not make those sales. Um, the Treasury Department uh, has recently uh, issued sanctions against some of the uh, precursor chemical um, uh, dealers in, Me in um, um, China. Um, we think that's a, a useful way um, to cut off some of that, and uh, I know that Treasury will be doing more in that respect. I also agree that uh, the United States has responsibilities to prevent the transshipment of arms from the United States to the cartels in Mexico. Uh, as, as we saw in a, in a very recent arrest of some of the cartel leaders, uh, the, uh, the Mexican military was almost outgunned um, by the uh, weaponry that the cartels now have. So I think I would align myself with everything that you've said.
Uh, Mr. General, Attorney General, uh, thank you for your answer. My time has expired. If you need resources or tools that this committee can help provide, please let us know. And uh, I would ask you to specifically work to repair the relationship between uh, the Mexican government and the uh, DEA. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moran. Um, we will now go to Senators Murray and then Collins, and then we will take other questioners in order of appearance. So, Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much, Chair Shaheen, and to Ranking Member Moran. I think everybody on this dais knows really well that uh, Senator Collins and I... Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Grassley. At last year's FBI oversight hearing, Ray committed to protecting whistleblowers that have approached my office about wrongdoing at the uh, department and the FBI. Uh, do you commit to me, this committee and the Senate as a whole, that any retaliatory conduct against whistleblowers uh, will be uh, uh, disciplined? I, I do, Senator, and, and uh, you know well, uh, uh, more than any other member of this committee, that I've been a staunch uh, supporter of uh, whistleblowers and of the False Claims Act uh, all, during the entire period of my role as a judge as well. I'm going to set up a hypothetical pat, uh, fact pattern for you and, and ask you to tell me how you would handle it. Uh, the Justice Department and the FBI receive information from over a dozen sources. That's the first one. Second, those sources provide similar information about potential criminal conduct relating to a single individual. And third, that information was shared with the department and FBI over a period of years. According to department policy and procedures, what steps would the department take to determine the truth and accuracy of the information provided by those sources? I'm sorry, these are whistleblowers, so they're internal sources, is that what you're saying? I'm not sure. Does matter where that comes from, just the fact that I wanna know you got that information, How? How would you go about handling it? Yeah. So um, reports of uh, wrongdoing um, are uh, normally re reported to whatever the appropriate department component is. It might be uh, U.S. attorney's offices in the district in which it uh, allegedly took place. It might be uh, to the directly uh, to FBI components uh, and to FBI task forces. Um, um, in cases involving whistleblowers, of course, there are specific provisions uh, uh, for um, uh, making um, uh, complaints to the uh, Inspector General's Office or the Office of Professional Responsibility uh, or um, the Inspections Division of the FBI. Uh, recent lawfully protected whistleblower disclosures to my office indicate that the Justice Department and the FBI had at one time over a dozen sources that provided potentially criminal information relating to Hunter Biden. The alleged volume and similarity of the information would demand that the Justice Department investigate the truth and accuracy of the information. According to, uh, what st accordingly, what steps has the Justice Department taken to determine the truth and accuracy of information provided? Uh, Congress and the American people, I think, have a right to know. Um, so uh, as the committee well knows from my confirmation hearing, I promise uh, to leave, I promised to leave the matter of Hunter Biden in the hands of the U.S. Attorney uh, for the District of Delaware, who was appointed uh, in the previous administration. So any information like that should have gone, uh, or should or should have uh, gone to that U.S. Attorney's offices and the FBI squad that's working uh, with him. I have pledged not to interfere uh, with that investigation, and I uh, have carried through on my pledge. In April 2022, you testified to Senator Haggerty uh, that the Hunter Biden investigation was insulated from political interference because it was assigned to, as you just now told me, to the Delaware Attorney's Office. However, that could be misleading because without special counsel authority, he could need permission uh, of another U.S. attorney in certain circumstances to bring charges outside the District of uh, Delaware. I'd like clarification from you with respect to these concerns. Uh, the, the, the U.S. Attorney in Delaware has been uh, advised that he has full authority uh, to, to make those kind of uh, referrals that you're talking about or to bring cases in other jurisdictions if he feels it's necessary. And I will assure that if he does, uh, he will be able to do that. Does the Delaware U.S. Attorney lack independent charging authority over certain criminal allegations against 
the president's son outside of the district of Delaware? Um, he would have to bring, if it's in another district, he would have to bring the case in another district. But as I said, uh, I have promised to ensure that he's able to carry out uh, his investigation and that he be able to run it. And if he uh, uh, needs to bring it in another jurisdiction, he will have full authority to do that. If you provided the Delaware U.S. Attorney with special counsel authority, isn't it true that he wouldn't need permission of another U.S. Attorney to bring charges? Oh, it's a kind of a complicated question. Um, if uh, uh, under the regulations, that kind of act he would have to bring to me, uh, under to the Attorney General under the regulations, those kind of um, um, charging decisions would have to be brought. I would then have to, um, 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 you know, authorize it and uh, 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 permit uh, it to be brought in another jurisdiction. Um, and that is exactly what I promised to do here already, um, that if he needs to do, uh, bring a case in another jurisdiction, he will have my full authority to do that. Uh, has the Delaware U.S. Attorney sought permission from, uh, uh, permission of another U.S. Attorney's office, such as in the District of Columbia or in California, to bring charges? If so, was it denied? So I, I don't know the answer to that. I do, uh, and I don't want to get into the internal elements of decision making by the U.S. Attorney. But he has been advised that uh, he is not to be denied uh, anything that he needs. And uh, if that were to happen, um, it should uh, ascend through the department's ranks. And I have not heard anything uh, from that office to suggest uh, that uh, they are not able to do everything that the U.S. Attorney wants to do. Well, let me uh, give you my view. If uh, Weiss. The U.S. attorney there in Delaware must seek permission from a Biden uh, appointed U.S. attorney to bring charges. Then the Hunter Biden criminal investigation isn't uh, insulated from political interference, as you've uh, publicly proclaimed. Uh, if the Justice Department received information that foreign persons had evidence of improper or unlawful financial payment uh, paid to elected officials or other politically exposed persons, and those payments may have influenced policy decisions, would that pose a national security concern and demand a full investigation? And uh, when Ray was here, he seemed to a answer that question uh, in, in uh, uh, that it was a national security concern. I want your opinion. Uh, in the way that you're, if I, if I follow the question exactly right, if it's an agent of a foreign a government asking um, uh, someone uh, and paying someone to uh, do things to support that foreign government in secret, yes, uh, I definitely think that would be a national security problem. Okay, my last question is to, uh, 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 wh whistleblowers have confidentially asserted that the DOJ's Public Integrity Unit, uh, uh, I think I'm going to leave that question for another round. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Senator. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Attorney General Garland, for being here. For attending. In your opening statement, you said that you work to uphold civil rights. Uh, is the Sixth Amendment one of those in the Bill of Rights? The Sixth Amendment is one. It, it is, great. certainly a civil and, right. And you work to uphold civil rights for all Americans, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. When the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution says the accused shall enjoy the, speed, a, the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury, what kind of a time frame does a speedy trial mean? Well, the, there's two different ones. So there's the Speedy Trial Act. That's um, correct. Um, I used to be able to tell you exactly how long it took, but I believe the, at least the first part I remember is 30 days from the complaint. That's correct. Um, I don't. I think it's 120 days after that, and then there are exceptions for different motions for a speedy trial. Okay, I believe the it says 70 days from the filing of charges of the defendant's appearance before the judicial office. Been a long time since I actually appeared in magistrate's court to make that argument. Okay, great. I'm glad you are well aware of that. Mark Houck was arrested September 23, uh, 3rd, 2022, and found not guilty on January 30th, 2023. The jury deliberated about an hour. DOJ accused Houck of twice assaulting the volunteer in front of a Planned Parenthood clinic and charged him with two counts of violating the FACE Act, freedom of access to clinic entrances. The arrest to the trial took just over four months. Would you consider that a speedy trial? Yes. All right. So would I. Last week, I visited the D.C. Department of Corrections and met with some of the 20 prisoners who were arrested in connection to the events at the Capitol on January the 6th. According to a Just Security article that came out on March the 20th, 11 of the 20 have not accepted a plea deal, 
nor have they even been brought to trial. Today is March the 29th, 2023. Attorney General Garland, is it correct that since their arrest, some of these individuals have been waiting approximately two years for their trial? Look, I, I don't know the specifics of individual cases. The beauty of the Sixth Amendment is that uh, each of those people is entitled to a, a lawyer, has a lawyer, who can make a speedy trial argument in the court. Oftentimes, lawyers ask for more time. Oftentimes, they ask for exceptions for discovery. There was an enormous amount of discovery in those cases, but I don't know anything about the particular cases. Does waiting two years for a trial meet the speedy trial clause of the Sixth Amendment? It can if the exceptions to the Speedy Trial Act um, are met. Those are the responsibility of the lawyers for those uh, defendants to bring to Well, the I would like you to look into that because to me, I don't think waiting two years for your trial complies with the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution. This is an argument to be made before the judge. The judge has the authority to dismiss a case for a violation of the Speedy Trial You're Act. You're absolutely correct. A judge does have that authority. You know, like you said in your opening statement, you work to uphold the civil rights of all Americans. I think in this case, their civil rights are being violated, and I would appreciate you looking into that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm listened with interest to the comments of the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I'm glad that he got a response, the minority got a response to their letter. I also sit on judiciary and my chairman, Mr. Jordan, has asked me to ask you about a letter he sent back in January asking you to appear before his committee. He has not gotten a response to that letter. And uh, so I'd ask you, can I get a commitment from you to pr respond to him um, in the immediate future with several dates that, that would be uh, uh, during which you would be available to appear I'm before the appear Judiciary before, Committee? Of course I'm going to be here, up here before the House Judiciary Committee. I understand there are discussions about scheduling that have been going on. I don't think there's any problem in that respect. There's been no response to the letter, so um, I, I think there's some question uh, about whether you would be willing to appear. So getting your commitment to appear is helpful, and I thank I am you willing, for that. More than willing. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Deputy Monaco, for being here, and, and thanks for your service. In early March, we had uh, Attorney General Garland before this committee, and I asked him a series of questions about 18 U.S.C. Section 1507, and specifically, uh, why no arrests have been made at the homes of Supreme Court justices in violation of that statute, which prohibits people from protesting or demonstrating outside the home of a Supreme Court justice or a judge or a juror or other officer of the court with intent to influence any court proceeding. His, uh, his answer was succinct, uh, but it amounted to the, it was to the effect that the marshals are on the ground and the marshals have full authority to arrest under any federal statute, including section 1507. About three weeks later, uh, my uh, friend and colleague uh, from Alabama, Senator Katie Britt, before another committee asked Attorney General Garland about a slide deck that she had discovered that was being used to train the U.S. Marshals uh, who were performing their protective detail duty at the homes of Supreme Court justices. These slides seemed to contradict what Attorney General Garland had told me three weeks earlier. Uh, they, they, they contradicted in several respects. Um, first of all, the, 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 the slide number four says that in order to make an arrest there, they really need to be looking at something that demonstrates, it, quote, the intent of influencing judge, uh, any judge language, thus logically goes to criminal threats and intimidation, not First Amendment protest activities. Now, I, I personally, as I've poured through that statute, I don't see that as an element of the offense. It's not an element of the, the offense. There's nothing in there that requires it uh, uh, to, to have this separate uh, non-specified element uh, within 1507 about the intent um, uh, being um, uh, something amounting to criminal threats and intimidation. Uh, uh, that's not in there. Uh, just as troubling, maybe even more so, is slide number five cited by Senator Britt at that same hearing, where it says that, quote, any contemplated U.S. Marshal Service enforcement action under 1507 should be coordinated in advance with the appropriate U.S. Attorney's Office. And as if that were not enough to discourage uh, uh, the marshals from making arrests under Section 1507 in this circumstance, it goes on to say that 
it is counterproductive to make probable cause arrests on cases that the U.S. Attorney's Office will not charge and prosecute. So I've been wondering, how exactly is it considered to be the full authority to arrest people under Section 1507, as the Attorney General has described, if you have to get preclearance first to do it, and if you're adding an additional element, one not found in the United States Code? Well, Senator, I know the Attorney General has spoken quite directly to this about the direction that he has given and has repeatedly given to the Marshal Service and the Marshal Service Director. When he was asked very- about these slides, by the way, he was not aware of them. Uh, uh, were you aware of them? Were you aware of them uh, before they were given to the Marshal Service to train marshals on how to protect the homes of Supreme Court justices? No, Senator, but I also know that the uh, Marshal Service Director has been very clear that he is... Um, uh, will regularly review the training provided to the um, deputy U.S. marshals who continue to this day to provide 24-7 um, protection for the um, justices, their homes, their property, at the unprecedented direction of Attorney General Garland last year. This has never happened before in the history of the department. I, where I, these- I understand that, but I'm asking about the enforcement of Section 1507. Now, you're the Deputy Attorney General. Under the organizational chart of the Department of Justice, you have supervisory authority, oversight, over the U.S. Marshal Service, is that right? That's correct. And, and, and so you're saying you had not seen these slides before they, the marshals were trained on it. That's I correct. assume you've re- reviewed them since then? Uh, I've seen the slides that you referenced that Senator Britt showed to the Attorney General. And uh, have you discussed them with Attorney General Garland? I have not, Senator, but I would like to make very clear the direction the Attorney General gave to um, the director of the U.S. Marshal Service, who himself has indicated that he has been told repeatedly by the Attorney General that he has full authority to enforce all federal laws, including 1507, as long as and as long as he's prioritizing and the deputy U.S. Marshals are prioritizing the life, the safety, the protection of the property of the justices, which under, is under any of the other federal statutes under which they're authorized to make an arrest on the ground. Have they added an additional non-statutory element to the offense, or have they required preclearance with the U.S. Attorney's Office prior to making a probable cause arrest? Well, Senator, without um, necessarily adopting your interpretation of, of the slides, the director of the Marshal Service has been very clear. He's going to regularly review that training. He's got all the authority repeatedly given to him and directed by the Attorney General to enforce federal law. Uh, His priority, however, and that of the deputy U.S. marshals who are providing that security and that protection is for the property, the life, the safety of the justices and their families. And yet since this slide was revealed to the public, he hasn't either corrected his statement or gone back to the marshal service and asked that the additional non-statutory element be removed or asked that the pre-clearance from the U.S. Attorney's Office be approved prior to the making of a probable cause arrest under Section 1507. The the statement uh, by the Attorney General was very clear and not in need of correction. He was very clear about the direction that he is given to the Marshal Service. He had no idea what direction had been given to the Marshal Service. No idea whatsoever. So we can say a lot of things about it. It was not clear, and he hasn't cleared it up, and it's rather inconsistent with what he told us in front of this committee. Respectfully, Senator, the Attorney General was clear his direction to the Marshal Service, to the Marshal Service Director, was to prioritize the life, safety, and um, uh, protection of the property of the justices, to have the full authority to enforce any federal law. With preclearance and with additional elements not found in the statute. Respectfully, Senator, that was not the Attorney General's uh, testimony. That was not his statement, his direction to the Well, he wasn't aware of it. It couldn't be in his statement. He didn't know about it. Not when he talked to me, not when he talked to my colleague, Katie Britt. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman uh, from Colorado is recognized. I thank the Chairman. Uh, Mr. Durham, thank you for testifying today. Thank you for your service. It's been a real pleasure. Our country. (laughs) Well, we appreciate your service to our country, to the Department of Justice. Uh, I've read your report, as I suspect most of the members of the committee have, and um, appreciated your work. I want to talk a bit about your interactions with Maine Justice, the Department of Justice in particular, with Attorney General Garland. Did Attorney General Garland permit your inquiry to proceed independently? Yes. 
did Attorney General Garland interfere with your inquiry, your investigation in any way? No. Did Attorney General Garland attempt to prevent or stop you or your team from taking any investigative step that you deemed necessary? He did not. Did Attorney General Garland provide support to your efforts? Um, in, in terms of um, occasionally we would need some additional personnel. Uh, in a couple of instances, we had a person that was detailed uh, from Maine Justice. Yes, so in that, in that respect, yes. Did Attorney General Garland decline to implement any of the recommendations that you've made? Um, I, don't, I don't know that. The letter, the report, I believe it's on page three uh, of your report, you say, and I'll quote, after the inauguration of President Biden, Attorney General Garland met with the Office of the Special Counsel. The office very much appreciates the support consistent with his testimony, referring to Attorney General Garland, during his confirmation hearings that the Attorney General has provided to our efforts and the Department's willingness to allow us to operate independently, end quote. And you stand by that, I suspect. I do. Correct. Sounds like the Department of Justice and the Attorney General were supportive of your efforts, did not interfere in any way with uh, the work that you did over the course of the last several years. There are some folks here in Congress, some colleagues of mine on the other side of the aisle, who have uh, talked about or indicated their desire to defund the Department of Justice. Do you believe the Department of Justice should be defunded? I don't believe these um, uh, discussions about defunding the police make any sense at all for the security of the nation, and I don't think defunding um, cornerstone law enforcement uh, entities um, make a whole lot of sense. Maybe more oversight, but defunding in our cities and streets and so forth, no, that doesn't make sense to me. But I've only been at this for 40 years. Sure. Well, and as I said, I, I, I am grateful to your service, and, for your service, rather, and I guess I just want to put a finer point on it because I, don't, I guess I didn't hear that in your answer. You said a cornerstone of law enforcement. I take that you mean the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice obviously should not be defunded, right? You've, you've give, committed your career to the Department of Justice. You were a former U.S. attorney, a former acting U.S. attorney, 35 years as an assistant U.S. attorney. You have a decorated record of service to the department. I, I, I'm hoping you're willing to say on the record clearly that you don't believe the department should be defunded. I don't believe the Department of Justice or the FBI should be defunded. I think there may be, ought to be some changes and, and, and the like, but defunded, no. Thank you, um, and I appreciate your candor, and I agree with you. And, and, uh, with respect to the Office of the Special Counsel, of course, you've concluded your service. As you know, there are uh, different special counsels that are appointed from time to time. You've served in that capacity multiple times yourselves. There is discussion of defunding special counsels. Do you support more broadly uh, the principle of, of defunding the Office of the Special Counsel. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would have to know, uh, know the particulars of what the discussion is, but I mean, the, the general notion that you had um, established Special Counsel Office, and the Special Counsel is doing an investigation, that you're going to defund it would not make sense to me. Yeah, I, I agree. And just to put a finer point on this, you served as Special Counsel for a period of years. During the course of your investigation, for the bulk of that time, Democrats were in control of the United States House of Representatives. Uh, there was no effort that I'm aware of uh, to defund your office. And I, I assume that you would have construed that if someone had made an effort to defund the Office of Special Counsel, your office, as you were undertaking your investigation as political interference to the extent that that was being done to try to impair or impinge on your investigation. Is that an accurate Statement. Yeah, I mean, if it were if it were uh, our office, our team, I guess I'd have to know the basis of that to see if I thought it was you know political or that, you know. Uh, let's we say were, it's let's say it's because people did too much money. Sure, let's say it's because people disagreed with the work that you were doing. They didn't like your the investigation. They they disagreed fundamentally with decisions you were making. I presume you would construe that as political interference. Uh, special counsels should operate um, independently. That's the whole purpose of uh, special counsel. So. I certainly agree. And again, I thank you for yeah. being here. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Do you believe, I'm going to shift to um, combating gun violence. Do you believe that a prohibited person that acquires a gun illegally and disposes it in a dumpster where a criminal or an innocent child could gain access to it should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law? 
this is uh, no longer a hypothetical question. You're referring to a specific case, which is now in um, um, judicial determination before a court of law. It's not appropriate for me to comment on that case. So for the record, Mr. Chairman, let's understand that the same prosecuting attorney who is now the special counsel gave a sweetheart deal to that person. And yes, you are correct. We're referring to the president's son. He got a sweetheart deal. And the judge was smart enough to smell a rat when she saw it. And she said, you guys go back to the drawing board. That same special counsel is in charge of this investigation. Isn't that correct, Mr. Chairman? Absolutely. I want to close real quickly with this. There was a world naked bike ride in Madison, Wisconsin, just a couple months ago. And I sent you a letter two months ago asking if you had a problem with that um, because it exposed a 10-year-old girl by the race organizer, the bike organizers, to pedaling around Madison, Wisconsin naked. Do you think that's a problem? And why did you not answer our letter from two months ago? I'm sorry, I'll have to get, uh, ask the Office of Legislative Affairs to get back to you about this. Does it typically take two months to be able to answer questions like this? Uh, it sounds like you're asking about a question about state and local law enforcement. Um, we get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters. Um, I'll ask the Office of Legislative Affairs where that letter is. State and law, local law enforcement would not act. We were hoping you would. It's obvious you're not. I yield. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman. With that, I would yield to the gentleman from New York, the ranking member, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, at the outset, let me make two comments. One, just about every assertion you made in your opening statement has been completely refuted by witnesses who have testified before this committee. Two, far from being favored, many commentators have noted that people accused of simple gun possession while under the influence of a drug, when that a gun was not used in the commission of a crime are rarely, if ever, prosecuted the way Hunter Biden is being prosecuted. Mr. Chairman, one of this committee's most important duties is conducting oversight of the Department of Justice. We are called upon to ensure that the DOJ uses the enormous amount of power it is granted in a fair, just manner that respects the civil and human rights of all Americans. The Attorney General of the United States oversees issues that affect the lives of each and every American. Violent crime, drug trafficking, attacks on our civil rights, threats to our national security, and environmental crimes all fall under his purview. That is why we regularly request that he or she appear before this committee to speak about the work the department is doing for the welfare of the country. This is how we ensure that the department stays accountable to the American people. But if we're up to the Republicans, Americans would hear nothing about any of these substantive issues today. They would hear nothing about the rise in domestic terrorism and what the Justice Department is doing about it. They would hear nothing about what the Department is doing to stop hate crimes and prevent gun violence. They would hear nothing about how the Department is disrupting efforts by Russia, China, and others to interfere in our elections. Extreme MAGA Republicans have poisoned our vital oversight work. They've ignored our legitimate oversight responsibilities and use their power to stage one political stunt after another. They have wasted countless taxpayer dollars on baseless investigations into President Biden and his family, desperate to find evidence for an absurd impeachment and desperate to distract from the mounting legal peril facing Donald Trump. They have fought tirelessly to stop efforts to fight malign foreign actors trying to influence and manipulate Americans through social media. They have unconstitutionally interfered in criminal litigation and attempted to bully state and local law enforcement officers. They have publicized the names of witnesses who did not further their political goals, leading to threats of death and physical violence against those witnesses and their families. They have cost any number of private institutions and companies millions of dollars in legal fees as they struggle to respond to ridiculous and overbroad requests for information and transcribed interviews. They have issued subpoenas for show without making meaningful attempts to, to get the information they seek by consent. They have levied low, baseless personal attacks on any prosecutor to bring charges against Donald Trump or January 6th rioters. 
They have attempted to discredit investigators who are not hard enough on Donald Trump's political opponents. They have supported those involved in the deadly attack on our Capitol on January 6th in an attempt to overthrow a lawful election. They have justified conduct that we all know to be wildly illegal, like the theft of classified materials and incitement to violence. And through it all, rather than try to, uni to unite the country or solve the problems that affect us all, they have sought to exploit our divisions for cynical, personal, political gain. That is their goal, division. They want to divide this country and make our government appear like it's broken, because that is when their broken political party thrives. So today, I implore the public to see through the sham. I have no doubt that you will hear a deluge of conspiracy theories and baseless accusations. They will quote freely from so-called whistleblowers who have been broadly discredited or contradicted. They will viciously attack federal law enforcement. They will tell you that all 91 criminal charges against Donald Trump are part of a conspiracy, despite overwhelming evidence of each of Donald Trump's crimes. And they will attack Special Counsel Weiss, who was appointed, let us not forget, by Donald Trump, for not being hard enough on Hunter Biden. Republicans will continue doing what they've done for years, discrediting anyone who does not serve their political goals at any cost. And the shame of it is, that in this hearing room, like on the House floor, where we are barreling towards a government shutdown while my Republican colleagues call each other names, we could be working together to put people over politics and to solve any number of problems affecting the American people. More than 30,000 Americans have died from gun violence so far this year alone. Guns have become the leading cause of death for children aged 1 to 17, surpassing car accidents. Domestic violent extremism and white nationalism are on the rise. We are seeing active clubs and other white supremacist groups pop up around the country. Anti-Semitism is at an all-time high. Malign foreign actors like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea are attempting to influence our elections. Political rhetoric is causing threats against law enforcement officials to skyrocket. Our immigration court system is in desperate need of reform. Our election workers received death threats from conspiracy theory-driven extremists. Fentanyl is filling our streets and poisoning our children at historic rates. This list goes on and on, and we, the people in this room, are in a position to do something about it. In fact, it is our duty to do something about it, consistent with the oath we took when we were sworn in as members of Congress. We could work with the Department of Justice and Attorney General Garland to address any number of real substantive problems facing the American people. Instead, House Republicans will use their time today to talk about long discredited conspiracy theories and Hunter Biden's laptop. They will do it because they care more about Donald Trump than they do about their own constituents. I hope my colleagues will see reason and at least attempt, at least attempt to work with the Attorney General in good faith. Sadly, on the other side of the aisle, reason and good faith seem to be in short supply. In any event, Mr. Attorney General, I thank you for your testimony and thank you in advance for your patience. You the, the gentleman from Oregon is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for being here today. I'm, I would like to go back um, briefly to you, your uh, remarks regarding the, uh, before the Senate when you were confirmed and your promise regarding uh, Mr. Weiss, can you explain to us in a little more detail who you promised that you would keep Mr. Weiss on this case? Who, to whom was that promise made? Yeah, so a number of, of, um, 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 uh, of senators in my meetings with them asked me to make that promise. I think that was discussed in, uh, uh, in my interchange with a senator from Tennessee, I believe. And did that, did that promise that you made lead you to believe that even if that Mr. Weiss displayed a level of incompetence that you would be precluded from asking him to step down or precluded from replacing him. Look, when, when um, uh, someone asks me to make this appointment, they didn't ask me depending upon what the outcome was. Um, Mr. Weiss has made his uh, appointment, Mr. Uh, decisions, um, and Mr. Weiss is an experienced federal prosecutor um, with extensive experience 
um, uh, and with sufficient credibility to be appointed by uh, President Trump. Um, I just have uh, no grounds for interfering here. Right, so you haven't answered the question. The question was, really, what level of incompetence displayed by a, a prosecutor under your control would it take for you to make a change? But let's move on. Uh, the, uh, the level of incompetence I'm referring to, uh, I'll just read this to you. Uh, this is the same Weiss who headed an investigation that was trashed by whistleblowers who alleged that his investigation had been fixed from the outset. It's the same Weiss who ran an investigation in which agents were allegedly prevented from asking about Joe Biden, obstructed in their efforts to pursue questions, compromised by tip-offs to the Biden team on planned searches. It was the same Weiss who reportedly allowed the statute of limitations to run out on Hunter's major tax offenses, even though he had the option to extend it. It was the same Weiss who did not indict on major tax felonies and cut a plea deal that brushed aside a felony gun charge. It was the same Weiss who inked a wildly, widely panned sweetheart deal that caused federal judge, a federal judge to balk it and trash a sweeping immunity grant language that even the prosecutor admitted had never been seen in a previous plea deal. So there's a list of what I would suggest under many people's uh, definition would be incompetence. Are you saying that that's inadequate for you to have questioned I, what I'm he was say, doing? I'm saying that all of these are allegations. I don't know what the facts of them are. I have, as I've explained, stayed out of this investigation. Um, I was not present at any of the meetings discussed. Some of the meetings occurred under the previous administration um, where Mr. Weiss was assigned to the matter by the previous Justice Department. Um, and I'm not in a position to comment on them. That's too bad. Is that the, the, There's a scope of investigation memo generally issued when we start these things out. Who issued that scope of investigation memo to Mr. Weiss? Was it done back on, uh, when he was originally appointed to take on the Biden case? Is that when the memo was uh, telling him what he was supposed to do was issued? Is there a scope of investigation memo is my question. There's a scope of investigation with respect to special counsel, and that has um, been publicly transmitted to the chairman of uh, this Judiciary Committee and the Senate Judici Judiciary Committee. And who wrote it? Who wrote that scope? Yeah. Um, who decided what, what, what should be within the scope of that investigation? I'm sorry? Who wrote the memo? Who decided what the scope of that I decided what should be in the scope. If you'll compare that to the scope of many other special counsels, it basically is modeled uh, on the form, uh, format that we've uh, used in the past, uh, not only in this administration, but the previous one. The, the, in your uh, remarks delivered on August 11th uh, of this year concerning the appointment of David Weiss as special counsel, you say, upon considering his request, as well as quote, the extraordinary circumstances relating to this matter, end quote. <coughs> Can you tell us what those extraordinary circumstances were? I'm, I'm sorry. I okay, so this is your, these are your remarks back on August yes, 11th. Yes, And uh, it says, on Tuesday of this week, Mr. Weiss advised me that, in his, I'm just quoting from your memo. This is what Yes, he said. yes. Uh, in his judgment, his investigation has reached a stage at which he should continue his work as special counsel, and he asked to be so appointed. Upon considering his request, as well as, quote, the extraordinary circumstances related to this matter, end quote, I've concluded it's in the best public interest to appoint him special counsel. What were those extraordinary circumstances you're talking about? Yeah, um, look, all of the special counsels, including the appointment by um, Mr. Um, 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 uh, Barr with respect to uh, Mr. Durham uses those phrases. The reason he uses those phrases is because that's in the special counsel regulation. Um, I've said as much as I can say with respect to that uh, without discussing matters uh, relating to a pending investigation. I can't discuss matters with respect to a pending investigation for the reasons I've said. Thank you. Yield gentlemen, back. Gentlemen, yields back. I'm going to direct your uh, attention to a video here that we're going to play. Uh, obviously, that's a significant matter. It is an ongoing criminal investigation, and so I'm not going to comment on an ongoing criminal investigation. Were, were those pipe bombs operable? Again, the, the again. The ATF is the expert. Again, it's an ongoing criminal investigation, and under longstanding policy, I cannot comment. And we, As you know, this is a very active, ongoing investigation, and there are some restrictions on that, but we yes, will Yes, we can handle classified information, and we fund your department, and so you need to provide yeah. that. It's not, respectfully, it's not an issue of classification. It's an issue of commenting on 
ongoing criminal investigations, which is something that by longstanding department policy we are restricted in doing. And in fact, the last administration actually strengthened those policies partly That's because- That's not our policy though, and we fund you. So let's move on. I could, do you know how- So I'm not gonna violate this norm of, uh, of, of uh, the rule of law. I'm not gonna comment on an investigation that's ongoing. Peter, Nav Peter Navarro was indicted for contempt of Congress. Aren't you, in fact, in contempt of Congress when you give us this answer? This is an answer that's appropriate at a press conference. It's not an answer that's appropriate when we are asking questions. We are the committee that is responsible for your creation, for your existence of your department. You cannot continue to give us these answers. Aren't you, in fact, in contempt of Congress when you refuse to answer? Congressman, I have the greatest respect for Congress. I also have the greatest respect for the Constitution and laws of the United States. Um, the protection of pending uh, investigations and ongoing investigations, as I briefly discussed in another uh, dialogue a few moments ago, goes back to the separation of powers, which gives to the executive branch the sole authority to conduct prosecutions. Um, it, it's a requirement of due process and uh, respect for those who are under investigation, the protection of their civil rights. So well, with, all, with, all, do, with, with all due respect, respect Congress. with all due respect to that, uh, Iran-Contra was an ongoing investigation, and that didn't stop Congress from getting the answers. And you're getting in the way of our constitutional duty. You're signing the Constitution. I'm going to cite it. It's our constitutional duty to do oversight. Now, in that video... That was your answer to a question to me two years ago, when I said how many agents or assets of the government were present on January 5th and January 6th and agitating in the crowd to go into the Capitol and how many went into the Capitol? Can you answer that now? I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, last time, you don't know how many there were or there were none? I don't know the answer to either of those questions. If there were any, I don't know how many. You've I don't know whether there are any. I think you may have just perjured yourself that you don't know that there were any. You want to say that again, that you don't know that there I were have any? no personal knowledge of this matter. I think what I said the you've, last time. You've had two just, years to find it. out. And the day, by the way, that was in reference to Ray Epps. And yesterday you indicted him. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful coincidence on a misdemeanor? Meanwhile, you're sending grandmas to prison. You're putting people away for 20 years for merely filming. Some people weren't even there yet. You've got the guy on video who's saying, go into the Capitol. He's directing people to the Capitol before the speech ends. He's at the site of the first breach. You've got all the goods on him, 10 videos, and it's an, and it's an indictment for a misdemeanor? The American public isn't buying it. I yield the balance of my time to Chairman Jordan. May I answer the question? I'm going to ask you one now. Uh, yeah, let's, we'll let the gentleman. Yeah. Um, that, I, I, go ahead, but... The, uh, in discovery, in the cases um, that were filed with respect to January uh, 6, um, the Justice Department prosecutors provided whatever information they had about uh, the question that you're asking. Uh, with respect to Mr. Epps, the FBI has said that he was not an employee or informant of, of the uh, FBI. Uh, Mr. Um, Epps has been charged, um, and there's a proceeding, I believe, going on today on that subject. The charge is a joke. I yield to the chairman. The, the time the gentleman has expired, the chair recognizes the, uh, the gentleman from California. Mr. Attorney, recognized for her five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, General Garland, thanks so much for being here today. I know it's been a long day for you. Now, I'm relatively new to the committee, and I'm still getting my feet under me, uh, but as far as I can tell, what we are doing here today is talking about a lot of conspiracy theories, and it's frustrating and tedious for those of us in the committee, but I can tell you it is absolutely maddening for uh, my constituents back home in Vermont. We have so much important work to do to keep the government open. We're days away from a shutdown, and I just want to remind folks that we're in this situation because my colleagues across the aisle are reneging on a deal that a majority of their conference made along with their speaker. That's why we are in this situation. If they are successful in shutting down the government, seniors who rely on social security benefits will be impacted, thousands of Medicare recipients and applicants will be impacted, service members will stop receiving paychecks, veteran services will be curtailed. Those are the grim consequences 
from Republicans' inability and unwillingness to govern. I needed to start with that. Let's do some level setting here. Now, let's get to the real work of the DOJ and how Congress can help uh, the agency better serve its mission. Gun violence continues to plague our nation. We see the wreckage every day uh, on, on our television sets, on our computers, and in our, our communities. As a member of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, this issue is incredibly important to me and so many of my constituents. Now, I believe there's actual room for bipartisan congressional action on gun violence, uh, at least in some areas. Um, one of those areas, red flag laws. It's a great place to start. Vermont is one of 21 states uh, that was able to, to pass red flag laws. These laws are working to keep guns out of the hands of people who are in crisis. And yet, many states did not even apply for funding from the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act uh, to better implement red flag laws and to raise awareness about the program. In June 2021, DOJ published model legislation to help states craft their own extreme risk protection order. Now, Republicans continue to make unfounded accusations that these laws violate civil rights by taking guns away from Americans without any due process. Can you explain the due process protections that are put into place in the model legislation that DOJ pr proposed? Yes, and I would start by saying, of course, there's room for bipartisan agreement, and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is a very good example. Um, and that includes um, the ability to have funding for states that want to craft and put into place um, red flag laws. The requirement is that the red flag law um, um, include uh, due process protections. So I'm not, I don't know every element of the model uh, legislation, but the general idea is um, the um, uh, relatives or uh, friends of the person have to go to a court um, and get some kind of adjudication that the person is a danger to themselves uh, or to others. This normally relates to mental illness problems. It may relate to some others. Um, and, um, and so if a gun is taken away under those circumstances, there is then a right to uh, appeal, uh, to have a full hearing, um, um, in order to adjudicate uh, the question. Uh, that's the I, don't, I can't say I know every technicality, but I think that's about it. No, I appreciate that. And it's especially important to states like mine, rural states that have real issues with the, the silent killers, domestic violence, and also suicide. And so these are um, instances in which red flag laws can really make a difference. Uh, shifting gears here, um, I, along with Senator Warren and 20 of our colleagues, recently submitted a comment letter applauding the draft merger guidelines and urging agencies to finalize them. Corporate concentration remains a pressing problem for the U.S. economy, and I fear that we're falling behind in this area and American consumers continue to feel the pain because of this. With the introduction of the draft merger guidelines, how does the department plan to ensure that future mergers and acquisitions do not stifle competition or harm consumers? Because that's often the pushback that we get. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the intention of the merger guidelines um, is to set forth the enforcement policy of the department. Um, they, the, the different generations of, of the guidelines, which I hate to say it, go all the way back to the time when I was in law school, um, have been adopted and uh, and or been uh, um, helpful to uh, generations of judges. Um, I sat on at least two or three merger cases myself where we used some of the learning uh, from the merger guidelines. Uh, and we were, uh, the current guidelines reflect uh, uh, really an adjustment to um, the current technology, uh, two-sided platforms, uh, network effects, um, that simply did not exist at the time of the, the last uh, set of merger guidelines were passed. Thank you, Attorney General. Um, just briefly in closing, last year uh, you spoke on the subject and said that DOJ's enforcement against corporate crime has waxed and waned, but it's waxing again. That is news to my ears. Thank you so much for your service. I yield back. General, uh, lady, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a slide. Um, up here, and I'll start. In October or March of 22, Mr. Weiss was denied the ability to bring charges against Hunter Biden in the District of Columbia. In April of that same year, you testified before the Senate Appropriations Committee that Mr. Weiss was free to run the investigation without interference from the DOJ. 
According to the IRS whistleblower, there was a meeting in October of 22 where Mr. Wise said that he was not the deciding official on whether charges were filed. And we know that because we have handwritten notes from the IRS whistleblowers that was confirmed in an email to people in the meeting. Later in January, Mr. Weiss was denied the ability to bring charges again against Hunter Biden in the Central District of California. You testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee in March of this year that he had full authority, that Weiss confirmed that to us in a letter in June, that he had been granted, quote, full authority over this matter. But then he kind of backed up. In June 30th, he said, well, just, just kidding. Uh, my charging authority is geographically limited to my home district in Delaware. And of course, you appoint him a special counsel. So why the heck has his story changed so many times over the course of these investigations? Uh, Congressman, I have seen all the three letters. I've read them quite carefully. They are all consistent with each other. And I urge everyone watching this on television or anyone who's interested to look at those three letters. They are not inconsistent with each other and there's no change in the story. So, but you agree that he had, and you've said this publicly, that he had ultimate authority prior to the appointment of special counsel? I've explained this repeatedly here. I've explained this uh, in, in another proceeding. I said that Mr. Weiss would have the authority to bring a case in any jurisdiction in which he wanted to, and Mr. Weiss has confirmed uh, that he, had, he would have that authority. I explained that if he had to bring a case in another jurisdiction, um, as a matter of mechanics, it would require me to, to stop me or a delegate a delegatee of mine to, f to sign a 515 um, uh, uh, order uh, that is uh, very common. But um, Mr. And, Attorney and, General, and there was no for, nothing for, stopping that from happening. Forgive me for a second, though. But that's the, when you say you have ultimate. When he wrote a letter on your behalf in June, I have ultimate authority. This is prior to the designation of special counsel. Ultimate to me means like that you can go wherever you want to. Ultimate so means at, when at the, that particular point, sir, could he? file charges in the District of South Carolina, he would not have that ability, correct? He would have to go through that U.S. attorney. So that's not all, full authority. All he would have to do is ask me for 515 authority, and I would sign it right away, just like when he asked me to be special counsel. Within three days, I signed that. So he didn't have ultimate authority. He had the authority because I promised that he would have the authority. But he did not have that authority. See, here's where I'm going. If he, if he was denied the ability to bring charges in March of 22 uh, in the District of Columbia, if he was denied the ability to bring charges in January of 23 in the Central District of California, that's not full authority. These, these, these U.S. attorneys operate as gatekeepers, so that's not full authority to, to do much of anything. And you know what's remarkable to me? We sit here and we look at this, and his story has changed so many times. You know whose story hasn't changed? Mr. Shapley, Mr. Ziegler, the, the emails that confirm that he said, I don't have, I, I'm not the deciding person on whether charges are filed. And you know what the response back was from his colleague at, uh, at work? Yep, you covered it all, Gary. That is consistent. What Mr. Weiss has done is, is this shell game and saying that he has authority, he doesn't have authority, but these gatekeepers at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia and in the Central District of California, they would have the gatekeeping authority on whether charges are brought in their jurisdictions. I'm sorry. The, that designation, correct? Those words have no meaning, gatekeepers, et cetera. Mr. Weiss said he was never denied authority. I'm the one with the authority to decide who can prosecute in a different jurisdiction, and I promised that he would have that authority. I do not see any inconsistency here. <laughs> I was not at the meeting that Mr. Shapley was referring to. I know what I guaranteed, and I know what Mr. Weiss has said I guaranteed. Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. It's a Policy here. Okay. An individual who is believed to be providing useful and credible information to the FBI from any authorized information collection activity and from whom what the FBI expects or intends to obtain additional useful and credible information in the future, all right, and whose identity, uh, information, or relationship with the FBI warrants confidential handling. So these guys are individuals. You pay them $42 million a year. Did you know that? The, the, the IG said you're paying these sources $42 million a year. Did you know that? I know informants are it's paying It's $42 million a year. So 
Do you believe that they're credible, they're valuable? The FBI's using these guys. We're paying them a lot of money. Would you agree with that? I agree. Some are more Very credible. good. So they're credible. credible You're than paying others. them a lot of money. You got a lot of them out there. So let me paint the picture for America. Hunter Biden joins Burisma in 2014. Burisma, very, very corrupt Ukrainian energy company. He has no experience in oil and gas. He admits it. He says, I don't have any experience. I know why I'm there. I have a dad. I have with me a document called the FD-1023. Have you seen this? You're yes, familiar I, with it? I, okay, I, I it's used by the FBI, everybody in America. It's used by the FBI. It is a confidential human source reporting document dated June 2020. You're familiar with it. In this document, the FBI's confidential human source says, Burisma, now the corrupt company, needed to keep Hunter on the board so everything would be okay. And according to the human source, they hired Hunter Biden to, quote, protect us through his dad for all kinds of problems. Mr. Gardelin, does that concern you? The okay, it should. I got limited time. Remember, your sources are credible, trustworthy, on, honest, and valuable. Are you familiar with Victor Shokin? The document that you're Who is Mr. Victor Shokin? So I got three minutes left. You want me to answer that? Yeah, Victor Shokin. Who is he? I, I don't know. Do you want okay, me to answer Okay, he's the, the first prosecutor, question? folks. He's the prosecutor that was, he, he oversees all the corruption in Ukraine. We know there's corruption over there. For the American people watching, after a few months, a few months after Hunter Biden joined the Burisma board, Victor Shokin was named Prosecutor General for Ukraine to target corruption. And one of his investigations was into Burisma. In this FD-1023 document, the human source clarified that Burisma's CEO, the man in charge of Burisma, said he has many text messages and recordings that show he was coerced to make such payment to ensure Victor Shokin was fired. Matter of fact, there were 17 of them. Mr. Garland, it's clear, Joe Biden wanted Shokin fired so he would stop looking into Burisma, where Hunter was on the board. Would you agree? All right, let's let the American people decide. Play the clip. Play the clip. I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from Pay attention, uh, sir, Yatsin, please. You know, that they would take action against I'm the looking. state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to the press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of a bitch! <laughs> got fired, and they put in place someone who there was you go. solid. Mr. Attorney General, what you just saw, there was Joe Biden in his arrogance and role as the vice president in this country saying, if you don't fire Shokin, the United States isn't given the $1 billion loan. Why would Joe Biden say that as the vice president? Why would he say such a thing? Was it policy? Was it our policy at the time? Yes or no? It wasn't. I have documents here. Interagency policy committee dated a Point of information. Is the gentleman ever Shulkin, going to let the gentleman I'm on my time. Question? Pipe down saying Shokin had made significant the reforms. Texas. He's made significant reforms, Shokin did. Matter of fact, John Kerry says he was impressive. And you know, within a few months after Shokin was fired, they appoint a prosecutor that said, we're not going to look into Burisma anymore. Cancel that, forget it, we're not looking into Burisma. Boom, here comes the million dollars. Joe Biden threatened the Ukrainian president and the prime minister, everybody can see it, the fire Shokin, or the United States won't give the billion dollars. If that is not quid pro quo, sir, what is? I will tell you what it is, and America agrees with me. It's bribery, and it's impeachable. Are you going to do something about it? I bet you not, and that's why you, sir, also need to be impeached. I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. A very moving statement about your grandparents coming here uh, from Belarus to live in the country without fear of prosecution. I grew up in a very similar country, Ukraine now, and when I came here as a young person, I believed in the value as an American not to be afraid of my government. But I wanted to tell you, and I want to share with you and get your thoughts on that. 
are you aware that a lot of Americans are now uh, afraid of being prosecuted by your department? Are you aware about that? Are you aware of that? I'm just saying, are you aware or not? Uh, I think that uh, constant attacks on the department and saying no, it's that... It's not attacks. Well, let me, let me give you an example. I don't know we talk about January 6th. People. I'm sorry? Here, there, there are some people came on January 6th. There are probably were some people that came on January 6th here, you know, that had bad intent. But a lot of good Americans from my district came here because they are sick and tired of this government not serving them. They came with strollers and the kids, and there was chaotic situation because the proper security wasn't provided. That's a question that was answered really why. Why we debated for 45 minutes on the floor and didn't stop the debate after the people broke in into the Capitol. But these people came, they were throwing the smoke bombs into the crowd with strollers with kids. People were showed up, you know, FBI agent to people's houses. You had in my district, in my town, FBI phone numbers all over the district. Please call. Call that. People are truly afraid. I just want to make sure if you're not aware that you are. And this is a big problem when people are afraid of their own government. And I'll share some other things. We're talking about justice system. I don't question. You're probably not a bad person. I don't know you. But what I'll tell you, you're in charge of the department. And people right now feel, you know, I look at Durham report and I call on the FISA violations of queries of millions of Americans, right? It's like KGB, but when I read Durham reports, we have this, you have a nice, you know, playbook. First, let's have a special counsel, and then you don't have to answer any questions here. Then, let's extend slow work investigation on Hillary Clinton, on Hunter, Everything is slow walk. We were very quick on Donald Trump, but you were very slow walk. Then, by the time you know that investigation and its statute of limitation expired, and all of your agents need to be tested for amnesia, no one recalls anything. Okay, you probably should have as part of your hiring policy. So no one held accountable, which was egregious what happened, you know, in that report. When I read with them, I can't believe it happened in the United States of America. This is my frustration, I'll be honest with you. Then, it's very interesting, you know, regardless what it is, even people in Obama administration raise concerns. You know, how can President Sanz be serving on, you know, corrupt Ukrainian oligarchs? Do you understand that it actually can undermine the war in Ukrainian effort and policy? I think these concerns were raised. The Obama administration didn't do anything about it. These people are dying right now, and Americans don't trust this president. So you, I want to ask you one thing. You know, as you, you know, I don't need answer because I know you're not going to, but I think you're probably a good American and you care. And a lot of these people are so afraid they cover up this stuff, I think, in your department because they're embarrassed that what we became as a country to say that what our Department of Justice became. That allows Russians to do propaganda in Chinese. It allows them to destabilize our country. That is danger to our republic. It is significant danger. And I have just one more question from you. You know, and, I mean, I agree on corporate crimes and FISA stuff, even with Democrats, that we need to do a better job. One more question for you. Do you believe that, you know, you talk about rights to vote, but do you believe that only U.S. citizens should be voting in this election and doing anything to make sure that only eligible people vote in elections? Yes and yes. Okay, I would like to see that, what you do. Thank you. Neil back. General, the chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina. Mr. Attorney General, you're the only person who could ensure that Mr. Weiss had all the necessary authority, aren't you? I'm the only person uh, who can uh, uh, sign an uh, uh, agreement with respect to special counsel. Uh, the authority to do Section 515 can be signed by other people in the department. You're aware, ultimately, though, the authority is yours. Yes. You, you made the point that the, you don't take orders from the president about such things. You decide, ultimately, what the Justice Department will do. I announced at the beginning, I promised that he would be able to bring whatever cases he wants, and I have followed through on that promise. I'm permitted to make that kind of promise, and I have made it. Did you undertake to inform yourself, to, uh, to interact with him sufficient to ensure that he knew he possessed that authority? 
or that you would see to it that he had all necessary authority? I don't think there's any doubt that he knew. He has written three letters to this committee indicating that he understood he had that authority. You're also aware, though, aren't you, sir, that an, a senior IRS investigator, whistleblower, came forward and testified publicly that Mr. Weiss stated that he did not have such authority. He was not the decider. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of the testimony. I was not present at any point during that statement. And Mr. You, Weiss has, in, Mr. Weiss, who was present, has indicated that he had the authority and he knew that he had it. Subsequent to those developments, though, you decided to make Mr. Weiss special counsel, which you had not done before. Mr. Weiss made clear he did not ask me to be special counsel until last month, and last month I made him special counsel. Did you have some lack of information that you should have had that would have caused you to act earlier to make him special counsel? Mr. Weiss did not ask to be special counsel before. I understand he didn't ask. You've said that, sir. Did you take the necessary steps to inform yourself what authority he understood he had or what obstacles he was encountering? Look, Mr. Weiss had, as I said from the beginning, at the very beginning, that he had authority over all matters that pertain to under Biden. Have you, have, you un, have you learned that he was in fact deterred by decisions of the United States attorneys in the District of Columbia and the Northern District of California from proceeding as he thought best? With respect, uh, Congressman, Mr. Weiss has, said, has not said that he was deterred. He said that he followed the normal processes of the department. Um, and that he was never denied the ability to bring a case in another jurisdiction. Well, what changed then, Mr. Attorney General? What made you decide that it was sufficient to leave him in the situ situation he was until you decided to make him special counsel? Uh, Mr. Weiss asked for that authority, given the extraordinary circumstances of this matter, and given my promise that I would give him any resources he requested, I made him special counsel. So until that time, was it just a matter of his predilection, or did you, did you undertake to investigate and discern what he was doing with his authority and, what, and whether he had faced any obstacles? I did not uh, endeavor to investigate because I had promised that I would not interfere with this investigation. The way in to not interfere is to not investigate an investigation. Once he requested to be named special counsel, having not done so over months and months of your tenure, did you ask him what had changed that, that made him now need to be a special counsel? Mr. Weiss asked to be made special counsel. I had promised that I would give him all the resources he needed, and I made him special counsel. When did the Justice Department permit statutes of limitations to expire on some of the prospective charges against Hunter Biden for tax violations? I don't know anything about the statute of limitations here. The investigation was in the hands of Mr. Weiss to make the determines that determinations that he thought were appropriate. Are you unaware that, tax, that uh, statutes of limitations have in fact been allowed to expire after there having been tolling agreements in place? I'm going to say again, the determination of where to bring cases and which kinds of cases to bring was left to Mr. Weiss. Yes, sir. I understand that you've said that. That's part of the problem. The question is, are you aware that statutes of limitations have been allowed to expire while the matter was under investigation? The investigators were fully familiar with all the relevant law. I'm not asking for the excuses. I'm they, asking whether you're aware of that fact, sir. I'm going to say again. I'm going to say again and again if necessary. I did not interfere with, did not investigate, did not See, those make determinations. See, those are statements in response to other questions. Those, Everybody in the country now knows who's paying attention to this, that the Justice Department permitted statutes of limitations to expire. Every lawyer who's ever practiced understands the implications of allowing statutes of limitations to expire. Prosecutors, Do you not even know as you sit here whether that occurred or not? Prosecutors make appropriate determinations on their own. In this case, I left it to Mr. Weiss whether to bring charges or not. That would include whether to let statute of limitations expire or not, whether there was sufficient evidence to bring a case that was subject to the statute of limitations or not, whether there were better cases to bring or not. Time, the time the gentleman has expired. Um, the gentleman from Texas to recognize. Thank the chairman. Uh, thank the attorney general for being here before us today. On October 21st, 2021, before this committee, I ask you about Mr. Scott Smith a father in Loudoun County, Virginia, who was arrested at a school board meeting where he questioned the rape of his daughter in a bathroom in the public school there. You said at the time you were unfamiliar with the case. 
are you now, yes or no? I'm only familiar to the extent I've read about it in the press. You sent a memo on October 4, 2021, directing the FBI and U.S. Attorney offices to address, quote, harassment, end quote, of school boards, yes or no? Sent a memo to address violence and threats of violence in connection with school personnel. Directed at school boards. Not directed at school boards, directed at school personnel, school administrators. Throughout the country as a priority for the federal government, for the United States Attorney's Office. That followed a letter on September 29th, 2021 from the National School Board Association to President Biden and emails from the National School Board Association Director Chip Slavin to the White House in which the White House asked for specific threats. And one of the examples was Scott Smith. Subsequent to our hearing two years ago, 26 states left the National School Board Association and Slavin resigned on November 23rd of 2021. Last week, Mr. Smith was pardoned by Governor Youngkin. Do you think the governor was correct, yes or no? Pardon authority belongs to the governor. You don't have an opinion on whether the governor was correct? I don't know the facts of the case, so I'm not in a position to make Have you rescinded the memo that you issued in 2021, yes or no? What we're discussing- Have occurs, you rescinded the memo, yes or no? What we're discussing here occurs- Does the memo still exist? Is it still going, yes or no? Has it been rescinded? The memo was uh, intended to have meetings 30, within 30 days. Has the it thir- been rescinded? The 30 days have finished. Nothing has happened in more than a year and a half with respect to that but it memo. has not been rescinded, it has not There's been nothing pulled back. to rescind. Despite evidence that has come out from the National School Board Association commissioned report that White House officials discussed this with DOJ more than a week before the letter was sent, the NSBA apologized. Have you apologized, yes or no? I've testified seven times since that um, original um, memo That's the first time you're out. back here since we talked about it. I'm sorry? It's the first time you're back here in front of us. Have you apologized for putting that memo out that implicated Scott Smith as a domestic terrorist, something the governor of Virginia has now pardoned him from all of these accusations? The memo said nothing about him, nothing about parents being terrorists, nothing about attending school boards. The answer is it's not been rescinded and you haven't apologized for it. The answer is that's not an an Labeling an American citizen a domestic terrorist in a memo and referring to it and in a memo that's built on the back of that. But now we had this uh, compliments being driven to the Civil Rights Division. Let's talk about Mark Houck in Pennsylvania, a father who was arrested with heavily armed federal and local law enforcement in front of his wife and children. This after Mark Houck's lawyers had said he would appear voluntarily. Local authorities investigated, found no case. Mark Houck was arrested by the FBI for FACE Act violations. The jury met for an hour. Houck was acquitted. Now. When I was in federal court, I don't remember that being my result very often. In fact, I don't remember happening at all, where we went, it, took it to a jury, and it was acquitted after an hour. Did you investigate this or in question the United States attorney why they wasted resources for such an obvious result? And can you explain, yes or no, that that was a good use of the Department of Justice's authority? The Justice Department respects the jury's verdict. The decisions in that case were made by agents and prosecutors on the ground. Are you concerned that enforcement of the FACE Act has been biased towards pro-lifers over anti-life protesters, 126 to four by our count? And we're asking information to be able to track down the information of such prosecutions, but 126 times against pro-lifers versus four times for people who dare to question the issue of life. I've ex- so I'll, I'll just, I'll I'll leave that out there just to say that is the civil rights division at play. Meanwhile, we've got, uh, you know, the uh, very liberal progressive groups being targeted as well. Senator Cruz and I sent a letter to you asking for information about how the FBI informant had gone to a liberal group's uh, pro-life meeting, and yet we didn't get any response from you. So I'd ask if you would respond to our letter that we sent back in March asking about FBI infiltrating such a meeting. I don't know what you're referring to, but I will ask the Office of Legislative Affairs to look into this letter. Thank you. Finally, our tax cases require approval by Maine Justice, no matter what district has venue. Yes or no? Do tax I, cases, as a general just, matter, require approval by Maine Justice, say, no matter what district has venue? Yes or no? It depends on the circumstances in the example that is, I know is it you're generally referring speaking, to. Generally speaking, yes. Not Since Maine it, Justice runs tax division. Yes or no? Maine Justice runs the tax division. In the Hunter Biden case, I assured Mr. Weiss that That's not what I'm asking about. I didn't ask, I haven't mentioned that guy's name. I didn't. I very simply asked a very simple question. Do tax cases require approval by Maine Justice? As As a general matter. 
most of the time, but not when the Attorney General has granted authority to a U.S. attorney to do what he thinks is best. And in a turf battle, a tax Ms. division Mr. Chairman, changes. Mr. Chairman, point of order. I mean, I, 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 I recall time, my colleague in time is having a minute and a half of additional time. Gentlemen's time has expired. The, uh, uh, Thank you. Good day, Mr. Attorney General. And this may be the reason that, they, that it's good for you to leave the Chief Justice and that group before each of us speak, because you would have already heard all that. Uh, I want to thank you personally for your office and your engagement on Camp Lejeune uh, and on uh, obviously a vast amount of litigation. Uh, that is one of the many, many jobs that, that falls at your feet. One of the jobs that falls at our feet here is that we, we are watchdogs of the executive branch. You have previously said that you are not Congress's attorney, and you've said you're not the president's attorney. And I'm assuming that you're neither our prosecutor nor our defense attorney, and you are neither the president's prosecutor nor defense attorney. And that's why the, today's investigation really does deal with the fact that if you're not, by definition, the president's prosecutor, but we have an obligation to see whether or not the president or a member of his family or in concert with the president's activities in fact need to be overseen, um, admonished, or even prosecuted. And so I, wanna, I have a couple of questions for you, and one of them is that uh, you have not said this very much today, but you often say, I cannot comment on that because it's an ongoing investigation. And when we ask for information, you very commonly say that it is the policy, not the law, but the policy of the Department of Justice not to provide information related to an ongoing investigation. So far, I'm on track. Is that correct? I think, I, I think I've said more than it's just a policy. Um, I think the letters we've sent uh, uh, trace it uh, to the constitutional separation of powers, so, to Rule 6E of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, et cetera. But in general, I'm in accord with what you're saying. So one of the challenges we face is that just a matter of weeks ago, a federal judge found the actions of uh, now special prosecutor to be so outside what he could ag agree to that he pushed back on a plea settlement and nullified it and sent the U.S. attorney going back. In light of that, don't you think it's appropriate for that portion to be considered a pre-ongoing investigation and for Congress to legitimately look at the activities leading up to that failed plea bargain rather than wait until weeks, months, or years from now a case is fully settled? Yeah. So um, if... if You'll give me a chance. I, I, first, I, I don't agree with the uh, characterization of what happened in the plea. Uh, the district judge performed her obligations under Rule 11 uh, to determine whether the parties were in agreement as to what each had agreed to and determined that they were not. The plea fell apart, as you know, uh, and there's been another prosecution. So that leads to the second thing. We are in uh, Mr. Weiss is in the midst of an ongoing prosecution on the very matter that you're talking about. Okay, but uh, Mr. Attorney General, if we believe, and we do, at least on this side of the dais, that a pattern of behavior is occurring relative to the investigation of Hunter Biden, particularly and in including, well, he lived in the vice president's home, well, he operated commingled uh, with the vice president, and even today as he travels with the president. So in light of that, can you agree that, in fact, it should be reasonable for us to look at a number of items, including, and one that I want your answer on, and I know we have limited time, Mr. Weiss supposedly had this ability to bring a prosecution anywhere. He now explicitly has that ability. However, are you concerned and should we have the right to look into the fact that political appointees in California and in the District of Columbia refused to, in fact, cooperate with him in those invest in investigation that he was charged with doing in Delaware, but which flowed over into their jurisdictions? Isn't that, in fact, an example where those political appointees of the now president, that their decision not to cooperate with him creates at least an, an appearance of political interference with the investigation of the president 
son, and possibly activities related to the president? Look, uh, I'm happy to answer this question in hypothetical, but not in the specifics, because I have stayed out of this matter. Um, in the hypothetical, um, um, it is the proce normal process of the department that if a U.S. attorney in one district wants to bring a case in another, they go to that other district and consult. It's perfectly appropriate. They do that in order to determine what the policies are in that district, what the practices have been in that district, what the judges are like in that district. A, 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 a U.S. attorney in another district does not have the authority to deny um, um, a, another U.S. attorney the th ability uh, to go forward, and I have assured Mr. Weiss that he would have the authority one way or the other, and I think Mr. Weiss's letters completely reflect that. Thank you. To be continued. Time the gentleman has expired. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. On August 11th, 2023, you appointed Mr. Weiss special counsel. You wrote a letter to the House and Senate Judiciary Committees where you cited extraordinary circumstances requiring the appointment. Uh, you avoided answering the question when Mr. Benz asked you. I'll give you another chance to answer it. Uh, what were those extraordinary circumstances? Yeah. I'm afraid I'll have to give you the same answer I gave before. Um, I have gave as much as I can give, which is that he thought that the, it reached the stage where uh, it would be appropriate. That I had promised him that I would give him any resource uh, that he needed, uh, and, and and that he asked for it. And to go further uh, would go into well, a pending investigation. Okay, let's talk about that authority. Back on March 1st, uh, you told the Senate Judiciary Committee that Mr. Weiss had the full authority to bring cases in other jurisdictions if he felt it was necessary. On June 7th, Mr. Weiss wrote to the Judiciary Committee stating he, you had been he had been granted ultimate authority over the matter, including responsibility for deciding where, when, and whether to file charges. But by June 30th, he had changed his tune and said that his charging authority was geographically limited, and, he, and it would be up to uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and then you to determine whether uh, he can partner on the case, and if not, he can request special attorney status from the AG pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 515, and he had been assured that if necessary, he would be granted uh, 515 authority in D.C., Central District of California, or any other district where charges could be brought. Um, let me ask you, is there some distinct legal authority known as special attorney status? I'm sorry? Is there some distinct legal authority known as special attorney status? Yeah, section 515. Uh, permits the Attorney General to sign an order um, to authorize a prosecutor to uh, work in, uh, a, a, in another district. And if you had already decided that he had full authority, why did you feel it was necessary to sign that document? I'm sorry. I did why did you feel that, why did Mr. Weiss feel that he would need that extra authority if uh, you had conveyed to him that he would have all that authority. Uh, you'll have to speak with Mr. Weiss about that. I think his, his um, three letters are quite clear that he understood uh, he would have the necessary authority and that no U.S. attorney could block him. Okay. We asked you earlier about his request for this authority, and we need to know who he spoke to about this authority and when. Before he asked you in August, he had discussions about this with others at the department. Uh, who did he discuss special counsel authority with and when did he do that? Yeah, I'm not going to discuss uh, internal deliberations of the department. I guarantee that, Those Mr. Aren't, well. that Mr. Weiss would have the authority um, that he needed, and um, the moment he asked for the authority, I gave it to him. Did he discuss it with the Deputy Attorney General? Again, I'm, I'm not going to get into a discussions of deliberations within the Justice Department. That is not a valid constitutional objection. Well, that is a valid constitutional deliberation. It has to uh, con uh, constitutional objection. It has to do with the ability of the Justice Department um, to do its communications, just as your deliberations with your staff and with other members are protected by the Constitution. Detailing who had conversations and when does not implicate the internal deliberations at the department. The substance of those deliberations, simply detailing who and when, does not implicate those. Yeah, I'm not going to get into the internal discussions of the department or who talked to who about what. Mr. Weiss has told this committee that he well understood his ability to bring a case wherever he wanted, and I have said that he had that ability. So, do you think that the extraordinary circumstances that you cited in the appointment have anything to do with the June 22nd and July 19th testimony of whistleblowers, Special Agent Shapley and Ziegler? I don't think it has anything to do with uh, Mr. Shapley, no. Gentlemen, 
do you believe Christopher Wray is a competent director of the FBI? I think Mr. Wray is a person of the highest integrity, for whom I have great admiration, who has extraordinary experience, uh, both as Thank a you. career and so you, prosecutor. Thank you. You certainly don't think he would knowingly give false testimony to this committee, do I you? Sir, I am sure that he would not. Are you aware that uh, Director Ray, a couple months ago in sworn testimony, implicated you in a sweeping abuse of power? I doubt he would characterize whatever, you, uh, whatever he said in that way. Well, he testified about the school board memo that you issued uh, on October 4th of 2021, uh, in which you mobilized federal law enforcement powers against American parents. Now, of course, you didn't put it quite like that. Uh, instead, you found a pretext, which is stated right here, in the first line of the memo. In recent months, there has been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff. What was your basis for making that claim? I will say again, as I've testified numerous times in response to exactly the same question, that I, I, I saw numerous uh, reports in the press of violence and threats. You saw reports in the press, and so you decided to instigate a nationwide law enforcement initiative? If I may be permitted to answer the question. Please. Uh, numerous reports in the media of violence and threats of violence against school personnel of all kinds. We did, you, did you consult we, with the FBI director? We received a letter from the National Association of School Boards reporting. Yes, that letter contained anecdotes. It didn't contain data of an increase. Did you, yes or no, consult with the FBI director before issuing the memo? I don't believe I spoke with the FBI director, no. Why not? Why wouldn't you consult with the FBI director? Because the purpose of the memo, as is very clear from the memo, is to ask the FBI to assess the situation, to hold meetings, and to determine whether Mr. this Mr. Attorney was General, you started with a conclusion that there was an increase uh, in threats. Now, if you had bothered to consult with the FBI director, here's what he would have said. This is from his sworn testimony, that he was not aware of any such evidence. So my question to you, sir, sitting here today, is can you substantiate your claim that there was an increase? Of course, there will always be criminal, sporadic criminal activity in all quarters of society, but your claim was there was an increase. Can you substantiate that sitting here today? I can substantiate that by the reports in the press of violence and threats of violence and by the letters sent by representatives of thousands. That's a no. You're giving us anecdotes. I'm asking you if you had data. You also said in your memo uh, that you were committed to using the department's authority and resources to discourage these threats, identify them when they occur, and prosecute them when appropriate. Were there any such prosecutions? The emphasis should be there on when appropriate, and there were no such prosecutions, and that's good news, not bad news. There were no prosecutions, and in fact, Director Ray said there were no arrests, there were no charges. So you have no data to show us that there was any increase. You didn't even bother to consult with the FBI director, and then there were no resulting prosecutions, even though you said that they were coming. So I have to ask you now, in retrospect, was there a compelling law enforcement justification for the memo? I think you're mischaracterizing the memo. The, question, the purpose of the memo was to hold meetings, to open lines of communication with states. So is that a no? Yes or no? Was there a compelling law enforcement justification for that? I believe there was a, ne a reason to ask for those contacts to be made with state and local law enforcement. Well, the FBI director disagrees with you. When well, I that's asked not what the FBI director said. Look at it I'm right sorry. here, uh, Mr. Attorney General. When asked, do you have any reason to dispute the conclusion that there was no nationwide law enforcement justification? He said he didn't. Either he didn't see the reports or he didn't see the national. This is a transcript. School. I've sent you this transcript, Mr. Attorney General. So my question is this: Will you retract the memo? And by that I mean issue a formal document to the effect that it is no longer operative. I will not, because there was absolutely nothing wrong with the memo, as I have testified several times already. Even though you. your own FBI director says there was no justification for it, you will not retract it. The memo is mine. It's my decision whether it's necessary to make assessments like this. And I asked the Bureau to make these assessments and the other- Are you familiar with the concept of a chilling effect? I'm sorry, I didn't- Are you familiar with the concept of a chilling effect? I'm very familiar and that's the very reason- How would you define a chilling effect is, as it relates to First Amendment jurisprudence? That's the very reason why the second sentence of the memo- Please tell me what you do, uh, consider to be the definition of a chilling effect. That memo has no chilling effect. The I didn't ask you your opinion on whether the memo has one. I asked you what is a chilling effect. I'm telling you that the second sentence of that makes clear I've read the full memo. I'm asking you what do you define a chilling effect as? A 
Chilling effect is when um, um, people's uh, exercise of First Amendment rights are chilled by coercive activity by the government, which did not occur here. So here we're dealing Mr. with moms and Mr. dads. Mr. Chairman, you and point, I are point of order officials. with respect to the time. Yeah. Point of order. The, the gentleman's time has expired, but it was a pretty darn important question when the Attorney General of the United States can't define what a chilling effect is, so I thought it would let it go a few seconds. The, uh, uh, the Attorney General did define what a chilling effect is and said it didn't occur here. I don't think he defined it. He just, he just dismissed it. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I thought it was a very important five minutes. We now recognize we'll move to f uh, five minute questions and we will start with the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Weiss. The rule of law does <clears throat> distinguish our country, but you have not upheld that. You have allowed the rule of law to erode. And that's why 65% of the people in this country have no faith in the Department of Justice under your leadership. They don't trust it. They don't trust you. The reason is because they're witnessing every day a politicized Justice Department in a two-tiered system of justice. For example, they see the DOJ, of course, aggressively prosecuting President Biden's chief political rival, Mr. Trump, while at the same time, they see slow walking and special treatment given to the president's son. That's just a fact that everybody can see with their own two eyes. I want to focus on that investigation of the Biden family. We have many important questions for you today about that. Let me, let me just get right to the chase. Has anyone from the White House provided direction at any time to you personally or to any senior officials at the DOJ regarding how the Hunter Biden investigation was to be carried out? No. Have you had personal contact with anyone at FBI headquarters about the Hunter Biden investigation? Uh, I, don't I, don't, I don't recollect the answer to that question, but the FBI works for the Justice Department. It's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you don't support. recollect you don't recollect whether you've talked with anybody at FBI headquarters about an investigation of the president's son? I, I don't believe that I did. I promised the Senate when I came um, before it for confirmation that I would leave Mr. Weiss in place and that I would not interfere with his investigation. Okay, did I you ever... Kept, I have kept that promise. All right. Have you had personal contact with anybody at the Baltimore field office on the Hunter Biden matter? No. On July 10, 2023, U.S. Attorney David Weiss told Senator Lindsey Graham, quote, I had discussions with departmental officials regarding potential appointment under 28 U.S.C. Uh, Section 515, which would have allowed me to file charges in a district outside my own without the partnership of the local U.S. attorney, end quote. With whom did Mr. Weiss have those discussions? I'm not going to get into the internal deliberations of the department. Um, oh, but you must, sir. This is important for us. We have okay. oversight responsibility over your department, and we need these answers. It's appropriate and necessary for Mr. Weiss to have conversations with the department. I made clear that if he wanted to bring a case in any jurisdiction, he would be able to do that. The way you do that is to get an order signed by the Attorney General called a 515 order. I promised he would be able to do that, and he in his letters made clear he understood he would be able to do that. Okay, can you tell us about any briefings or discussions that you personally have had with Mr. Weiss regarding any and all federal investigations of Hunter Biden? I'm gonna say again, I promised the Senate that I would not interfere with Mr. Weiss. So you have not, I'm just under oath today, your testimony is you have not had any discussions with Mr. Weiss about this matter? Under oath, my testimony today is that I promised that the, uh, the Senate I would not um, intrude in his investigation. I do not intend to discuss the internal Justice Department uh, deliberations, whether or not I had them. Oh, okay, so your, your testimony today is you're not gonna tell us whether you've had discussions with Mr. Weiss. My testimony today is I told the committee that I would not interfere. I made clear that Mr. Weiss would have the authority to bring cases that he thought were appropriate. Okay. Mr. Weiss's All letter. Right. Okay, let me stop you. For, for a second time, sir. Are you aware that FBI officials have come before this committee and they have stated that there was a cumbersome bureaucratic process that Mr. Weiss had to go through to bring charges in another judicial district? You know that? I'm not aware, but that's not true. There's nothing cumbersome about the process. So those All whistleblowers are to lying to us under oath? They're, those whistleblowers are lying? I didn't that say that. Their, their description of the process is cumbersome is an opinion. It's not a fact question. All I have to do is okay. sign a All section. Right. Let me get to the fact. Mr. Weiss has been the lead prosecutor on the Hunter Biden case since 2018, correct? I'm sorry? Mr. Weiss has been the lead prosecutor on the Hunter Biden case since 2018. Now, here's the question. He's been the lead the, prosecutor since he was appointed by President Trump. Okay, why, let me ask you, why has the Justice Department dragged this investigation out for so long? Does it really take years to determine if Hunter Biden lied on a federal form related to purchasing a firearm? 
Mr. Weiss was a longtime career prosecutor. President Trump appointed him as the You're United not States answering the question. Is that standard procedure? Should it take that long to make such a simple determination? I'm answering the question. Mm -hmm. Give me an opportunity to do so. Okay. He was charged uh, with that investigation under the previous administration. He's continued. He knows how to conduct investigations, and I have not intruded or attempted to evaluate that because I, that was the promise I made to the Senate. The whistleblowers uh, gave us testimony about serious misconduct at the Justice Department in regards to the preferential treatment afforded Hunter Biden. Has your office requested an investigation into that? Uh, there are well-known processes for how whistleblowers make their claims. I am a strong proponent of whistleblowers and a strong defender. We have an Inspector General's office. We have an Office of Professional Responsibility. That is the way in which complaints from whistleblowers should be and are appropriately handled. I'm out of time. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from, gentlelady from Wyoming, uh, Ms. Hageman. We got. <clears throat> we have been investigating very serious charges made about your department and other elements of the Biden administration, which allege ignoring the law to protect political allies from being held accountable for their wrongdoing. One aspect of this allegation brought by two very credible whistleblowers from the IRS, demonstrates a strategy of delaying criminal investigation into Hunter Biden and blocking any investigations into the corruption of Joe Biden. The whistleblower testimony notes that U.S. Attorney David Weiss in November 2022 allowed the statute of limitations to expire, even though Hunter Biden's attorney had already agreed to extend the statute on the 2014 and 2015 charges, which charges included an attempt to evade or defeat taxes and the fraud and false statements related to the million dollars that Burisma paid to Hunter Biden while his father was vice president. During a recent transcribed interview with the committee, FBI officials from the Baltimore field office refused to answer questions about the expired 2014 and 2015 tax charges because they were allegedly part of a quote, ongoing investigation. Are the tax charges related to these years in fact part of an ongoing investigation? Uh, again, I have no familiarity with the details of this particular okay. investigation. So you don't know one way or the other? That's right. I left All it right. up to Mr. So how Weiss. are charges for which the statute of limitations have already expired part of an ongoing investigation? Again, I... I I don't know anything about this case. In so, why would, so why would charges that have already expired because of the statute of limitations be part of an ongoing investigation? In a, in the hypo, to answer in the hypothetical, because I don't know the facts, often charges from previous times are used as part of an ongoing investigation to inform information about intent, about patterns and or practices. Or other investigations? So are there other investigations into Hunter Biden where this information may become relevant? I think it's a, a matter of public record that there are, is a tax investigation of Mr. Uh, Hunter Biden with respect to other years. I Beyond don't the 2014 and 2015? Beyond the ones that are, um, uh, or this, that you are referring to, I think okay, the, Mr. Garland, Mr. Weiss has already said that in, uh, during the plea proceeding. Okay, Mr. Garland, is it standard operating procedure in your Department of Justice for prosecutors to allow the statute of limitations to expire on very serious crimes when the potential debt defendant has already agreed to an extension? So there, as I said before, there's no standard operating procedure okay. here. This Maybe is a, there should be. Well, if this is, is an oversight hearing, maybe there should be. This, maybe you should adopt standard operating procedures to avoid this kind of a circumstance. Would you agree? No. Okay. Because it's left According to, to the one discretion of the IRS, of, You've answered my question. Thank you. Okay. According to one of the IRS whistleblowers, quote, the purposeful exclusion of the 2014 and 2015 tax years sanitized the most sub substantive criminal conduct and concealed material facts, end quote. How can Americans trusted investigation run by a special counsel who by allowing the statute of limitations to expire irreversibly, quote, sanitized the most substantive criminal conduct and concealed material facts? The prosecutor in question is an experienced veteran 
career prosecutor who was appointed by and President Trump. we have no reason to trust him, do By we? President Trump. Okay. How much in terms of taxes would Hunter Biden have owed on the $1 million he was paid by Burisma? Well, as you can imagine, since I don't know anything about the facts of the case, I can't answer Probably that question. Probably about $400,000. Isn't that right? I mean, you can do the math. You know the tax code. I don't know anything about the facts of this case, okay. so I'm not able to do the math to apply it to and facts. And by failing I don't to know. pay the taxes on those ill-gotten gains, what would the typical penalty have been? For example, if it was someone who didn't have the last name of Biden or a D behind their name. I'm sorry. These are all questions you'll have to direct to Mr. Weiss, and Mr. Weiss will address in in his final. Um, by allowing the statute of limitations to lapse, did Mr. Weiss effecti effectively gift the tax money Hunter Biden owed for the 2014 and 2015 tax years to Mr. Biden? Just say again, the decisions about uh, whether um, uh, in this area and whether these allegations are correct are ones. Uh, that Mr. Weiss uh, will be able to answer. Mr. Garland, you, one of the things you have done over and, uh, and repeated over and over and over again is that to point out that Mr. Weiss was appointed as U.S. Attorney by President Trump, yes. as though that somehow inoculates him from criticism by us. Is that really how this game is played? That if someone is appointed by a Republican, then they're supposed to be on the Republican team? Or the, if they're appointed by a Democrat, they're on the Democrat team? You were appointed by Mr. Biden, weren't you? Are you on the Democrat Let team? Let me just be clear. The, the point of, that, he's a, that he was appointed by a Republican counteracts the claim that he, this was a partisan decision to benefit Democrats. He, he remained as a, as, as a member of the Department of Justice. Mr. Chairman. I'm Mr. Mr. Chairman. Time the gentlelady has expired. Uh, yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Attorney General. You know, following your confirmation, Americans were promised they were getting a focused, nonpartisan to lead their federal law enforcement. I had my doubts back then. And the last two years have more than confirmed in my mind those fears. Never in my life would I have thought that I would see such a politicized, DOJ. Never in my life would I have thought I would see such a Department of Justice that didn't obey their own rules. Never in my life did I think I would see the egregious investigations conducted under your, under your watch or the blatant disregard of the First Amendment by FBI field offices under your watch. And never in my life did I think I would see our great DOJ turn to a, into a politicized weapon to be wielded by an investigation to attack political rivals. I still hold the thousands of hardworking staff with high regard, but unfortunately there are some within the department, in my mind, who have betrayed their oaths. And for that, you must be held accountable. I hold you accountable for the labeling of parents as domestic terrorists standing up for the, their proper education of their own children. I hold you accountable for the anti-Catholic memo. Imagine sending agents undercover into Roman Catholic churches because they were supposedly domestic terrorists. And I hold you accountable for unleashing a special counsel with a history case, of botched investigations on our current president's political rival. The department of, under your leadership, I am sorry to say, and I am sorry to say, has become an enforcement arm of the Democratic National Committee. If there is a perceived threat to the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, this DOJ attacks every single time. But when there are actionable threats against conservatives, this DOJ stays put. Protesters outside, violent protesters outside the Supreme Court Justice's home, unpunished. Attacks on pro-life centers, unpunished. The two-tiered system of justice is clear, and it's clear to the American public. And the buck stops with the man in charge. That man is you. The actions of the DOJ are on you. The decline of Americans' trust in our federal law enforcement is on you. The po political weaponization of the DOJ is on you. Attorney General, I need a simple yes or no to the following. Just yes or no, because we don't have much time. Do you agree that traditional Catholics are violent extremists? Yes or no? Let me answer what you've said in that long list of, of, of not, it's, I'll I be happy the, to answer all of those. Attorney General, just, I control the time. I'm going to ask you to answer well, the you, questions you, I asked. You ask. controlled time by asking me a substantial number of things. And I, let I me didn't give, ask you those things. I, I made a statement. The, Attorney will, General, through the chair, I ask you, do you agree that traditional Catholics are violent extremists? Look, 
Answer I have no question. idea what your what the traditional uh, means here. The Catholics, idea, let Catholics me just, that go I to church. Your, may I answer your question? Yes, the idea no. that someone with my family background would discriminate against any religion is so outrageous, Mr. so absurd. Mr. Attorney it's General, it was your FBI your that did this. It was your FBI that was sending, and we have the memos, we have the emails, we're sending undercover agents into Catholic churches. Both I and the director this of the FBI the have said that we were the appalled FBI have said that we were appalled by that memo. So then you agree the that they're not extremists? We were appalled by that memo. Are they extremists or not, Attorney General? I think that... Are they extremists or not, Attorney General? Everything in that memo is Are appalling. Are they extremists or not? I'm asking a simple question. Say no if you think that was wrong. Catholics are not extremists. No. Was anyone fired for drafting and circulating the anti-Catholic memo? You have in front of you the inspection uh, division's investigation. Just tell me yes or no, please. I don't know. We have the no answer. time. I don't know the answer to that. There okay. Do you agree that parents attending school board meetings should be categorized? Not should to parents that, in. Should yeah. parents that go to school board meetings and are very vocal about their kids' education should be they should they be classified as domestic terrorists? Uh, of course not. And my memo made clear that vigorous objections ba uh, to policies in schools are protected so it's no. by the First Amendment. The president this week accused you, not the president himself, his staff, and it was in the Wall Street Journal and it was leaked out of mismanaging the Hunter Biden probe. Do you agree? Yes or no? It was in the Wall Street Do Journal article. I'm not saying I'm sorry. that. Do I agree with the Wall Street Journal? Or? Yes, and, what, and that the information they released that said you botched this probe. Yeah, I think I have uh, uh, dealt with the uh, Hunter Biden investigation in the way I've told this. Mr. Committee. Chairman, I yield my thank remaining you, time to you. I appreciate it. The gentleman yields back. Uh, uh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, looking again at the appointment of, of Jack Smith and, and David Weiss, th this double standard of, of justice couldn't be more glaring. Uh, Jack Smith was deeply involved in the IRS scandal that targeted conservative uh, political groups to harass. Uh, his malicious prosecution of former Governor uh, uh, McDonnell was unanimously overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. Chief Justice uh, Roberts rebuked Smith directly for attempting to, to criminalize political activity. You appointed him to prosecute Joe Biden's chief rival for the presidency. And then we have the appointment of David Weiss. Weiss deliberately allowed the statute of limitations to run out on any charges that could have implicated Joe Biden in influence peddling. Uh, he originally offered Hunter Biden a sweetheart deal that was ultimately upended by the court. And he's the one you appointed to pursue the charges that could implicate Joe Biden. That leads me to only two explanations, either corruption or incompetence. So wh which is it? Those are the kind of questions that judges would rule out of order. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you would. <laughs> Which is it? Look, uh, I, I said uh, before, and I will say again, Mr. Weiss was the Republican-appointed United States attorney, appointed by oh, but, President but this, this, Trump. Do you, at least, do you at least see the obvious uh, double standard uh, applied in these two appointments? Mr. Weiss was a Republican appointee. Mr. W Mr. Um, Smith is uh, not um, registered to either party. His entire I, I career was as a career prosecutor. Are. I'm not that asking what their party registrations like are. I'm asking about their records and how those records would commend them to the appointments that you made. This is a question of judgment and it's a question of motive. What was motivating you to do this? Mr. Smith had a nationwide reputation for integrity uh, and for uh, oh, please, appropriate prosecution. <laughs> His work can be measured by what he actually has filed. Everyone in the country can see the indictments that he has How can you that say that Those... after he was so heavily implicated in the IRS scandal or, or the rebuke that the Supreme Court gave him many other examples? But let me go on. We've had two uh, uh, IRS whistleblowers inform Congress of attempts by, by senior Justice Department officials to obstruct the criminal investigation into millions of dollars of ill-gotten and undeclared income to Hunter Biden. They noted several deviations by department officials from normal process that provided preferential treatment, in this case to Hunter Biden, a direct quote. 
including allowing the statute of limitations to lapse, requesting IRS and FBI management level investigative communications, prohibiting investigators from referring to the big guy or dad in witness interviews, uh, excluding the investigative team from meetings with defense counsel, and notifying defense counsel of, of pending search warrants. The U.S. Attorney's Office even tipped off the Bidens of an impending search of a storage unit where their records were being kept. Now that sounds an awful lot like obstruction of justice to me. Was that coming from you or from somebody else? I'm sorry, I don't under, under was that coming from you? I don't, I don't understand the question. Uh, th all of the actions that your employees took to obstruct the uh, investigation of Hunter Biden and the tax er, earnings that he uh, made and the taxes he failed to declare their source and ultimately who they were paid to. I'm, I'm gonna say again with respect to the Hunter Biden investigation that it has been and still is in the hands of Mr. Weiss, an appointee of President Trump. I don't know about all of these allegations. Some of them appear to have been from the period when um, the Attorney General appointed by President Trump was still the Attorney do, do, General. Do, do these, do these uh, charges trouble you at all? Mr. Weiss will have an opportunity to explain the decision. Well, you're the guy made. in charge. Does this trouble you? I have intentionally not involved myself in the facts of the case, not because I'm trying to get out of responsibility, but because I'm trying to pursue my responsibility. Your, your uh, FBI director testified before this committee of an uptick in, quote, known or suspected terrorists coming across the southern border. And he told us that the southern border represents a massive security threat. Those were his words, a massive security threat. Do you agree? I am I'm, I'm perfectly happy to align myself with the director of the FBI. Well, why is it then that we have uh, seen your administration rescind the Trump era uh, orders that had secured that border? We've seen an exponential increase time in the suspected terrorists. Time of the gentleman has expired. The witness can respond if he chooses. I mean, this is a, the answer to this question about um, 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 uh, immigration law is an extremely long answer. I would defer to the Department of Homeland Security, which is responsible for the physical security and about first contact at the border. With well, we've tried to get answers from him, and he doesn't give them to us, so we're, we were hoping you would. Uh, I understand, Mr. Uh, Attorney General, you've requested a short break, so we'll, we'll take a short break and resume in five minutes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> 